Let's, let's start finding your way to a chair, please, so we can start on time. Find your way to a chair, please, so we can start on time. Make your way, make your way to your to your chairs, please, so we can start on time. Make your way to your chairs, please.
Let's find your way to your chairs, please, so we can start on time. All right, good morning, everybody. Let's get settled down and get ready to rumble, huh? Welcome to Bismarck State College. Welcome to the North Dakota, and welcome to the 2023 National Soil Survey Conference. Wow. What a world-class venue, huh? Are you liking that view? Just drenched with history. I'm really happy that you've all come to visit us. We have worked our tails off to make this week happen for you. I'm going to take a, a moment here and say welcome to BSC. This is a world-class facility and, and, and uh, it's newly designated North Dakota's Polytechnic Institute and I'm working with them to help in, increase their uh, their curriculum and, and it's, a, it's a fun process. And so this is going to be an even better higher end facility in the future. So welcome to BSC. And I'm gonna take a moment here and I'm going to have our folks that, that put, help put this together stand up and take a little credit. So Lance, Dr. Hopkins, Susan, stand up. There's our, our main local planning committee. And, and our soil survey staff, Keith, Jeannie, Perry, Kyle, Brianna, Krista, who am I missing? Mackenzie, stand up and take credit for that field trip yesterday. How about that? John. Those story maps, thank, thank Krista and Kyle. If you enjoyed those, take the time to thank them for taking them their time to put that together for you. They did a phenomenal job. All right, I'm gonna move on to our next guest and get out of your way and uh, introduce my new boss. Dan Hovland is, is our new state conservationist here in North Dakota and uh, he's coming to us from Indiana and uh, he's gonna welcome you to, uh, to uh, North Dakota for, for NRCF, so. Is it on? Yep, that, it's on now. All right, um, as Wade said, uh, I'm the new state conservationist uh, for North Dakota. Hail from Indiana, originally uh, born in Minnesota, raised in North Dakota. So I started my career in North Dakota. Um, started, I guess I graduated in Cavalier, but um, was in Carson, Bismarck, um, and graduated college from Fargo, NDSU. So <clears throat> it's great to be here. It's great to be back in North Dakota. Uh, this is, let's see, day one, week two. So. Uh, nothing like throwing it into the fire right to begin with. And my background is soils, so you know how much soil scientists love to get up and say something. So everyone likes to speak. Public speaking is our, our key. But um, <laughs> So anyway, this is a great opportunity. So it's my pleasure to welcome you to Bismarck, North Dakota, and North Dakota as a whole. Um, when, I was when I was asked to welcome an international dele delegation of soil scientists and ecologists, I jumped at the opportunity, like I said. Um, North Dakota has so much to offer, and we're excited to host a Soil Energy and Agriculture for Resilient Ecosystems Conference. While we will be discussing climate smart agriculture, the intersection of agriculture and energy development, ecology and agronomic applications, urban soils, as well as soil science and soil health, some of my favorite. I understand the purpose of the conference is to bring the cooperators uh, and partners together to exchange knowledge, increase understanding of soil resource information, and to develop recommendations of courses of action including national policy and procedures related to soil, soil survey, and soil resource information. 
We all know how important soil resource information is, uh, especially to our conservation planning process and getting conservation on the ground. I know most of the field staff use it on a daily basis, so it's, it's just so valuable and we can not do what we do without it. Uh, North Dakotans um, and the staff in, in North Dakota, they have a great work ethic and they have a lot to offer. North Dakota offers its guests, whether it be beautiful landscapes, the Missouri Plateau in the west, the Central Drift uh, Prairie, or the Red River Valley in the east, along with many resources and innovative approaches to getting things done, getting things done North Dakota has much to offer. I hope while you're here, you take some time and bolster our economy. North Dakota is the 19th largest state in the nation, but hosts the fourth smallest population, so we could use your support. Uh, each of you, while you're here, um, even though we have an expanding energy economy and sector, oil, coal, wind, uh, which has afforded North Dakota some challenges, but also some incredible uh, opportunities impacting our natural world. But even with that, your support would be much appreciated. Here in the plains, we get 14 to 22 inches of rain a year from the northwest to the southeast. But even with this limited resource of water, North Dakota and North Dakota egg are some of the best out there. When we look at production agriculture across the state, 90% of our lands is uh, dedicated to farming or ranching. We lead the nation in spring wheat production, dry edible beans, pinto beans, navy beans, canola, flaxseed, dry edible peas, and believe it or not, honey. And we're close second in black bean production, great northern beans, and lentils. Now, coming from Indiana, that's quite a difference because they lead the nation in like corn and beans, um, and that's it. So there's such diversity in North Dakota and such a great amount to really stockpile what we have and going into uh, the future and just opportunity as a, as a whole. So we're just not stuck on two crops. We have the diverse, uh, great diversity as you guys heard. We have a great agenda this week to put together for you for lots to hear for, uh, from the speakers and even more to see from our beautiful landscapes and soils. Um, we, have a little, we have the Little Missouri grassland, which is the largest in the U.S. with over a million acres. We're home to some more wildlife, more wildlife refuges than any other state in the nation. Uh, from the Theodore Roosevelt National Park in the southwest to the Frost Fire Ski Area in the Pembina Hills in the northeast. With Lake Sakakawee and Devil's Lake in between, uh, North Dakota provides endless landscapes to explore, and hopefully this week you're going to get to explore some of those. Also this week you're going to hear about where we started with some history from Dr. Andrew Clark and North Dakota's first people. Then on to traditional gardening practices with an entire group of highly coveted speakers throughout the conference. You're going to hear about what's been done during this transformation of agriculture during the Industrial Revolution. To multiple field tours looking at soils on reclaimed mine lands along with non mine land soils. You will get a chance to visit our 111 year old research station uh, in Mandan, the Northern Great Plains Research Station. And we'll close out and come back to Minokin Farm, Soil Health Farm, which uh, brings everything back to the basics. So I'm excited uh, for everyone to experience this, the great agenda and we'd love to hear what you guys think of the program once it's over. I'd be remiss not to recognize North Dakota State Soil Scientist Wade Bott and all the work he invested along with his team and partners to make all this possible. I know Wade stole my thunder on that, but again, uh, Lance Dewey, Susan sampson Liebig, along with Dr. Dave Hawkins from NDSU, all work collaboratively uh, and invest a great effort to bring this highly educational event together. Um, from what Susan told me, it, took, it starts two years process and then it's just go from that point forward. So thank you guys so much, and let's give him another round of applause for that. So Wade, is, uh, Wade came in last week, again, first week on the job. Day one, he came in that afternoon. We sat down, talked about the conference. Um, and Wade and I discussed the innovations that North Dakota uh, has taken, like the Raster Soil Survey, completed on almost 12% of land in North Dakota. Ecological site descriptions, which are so practical and useful for the field and application on the ground. Um, the, the Dynamic Soil Properties Projects and our long-term uh, soil health strategy in collaboration with ARS, NDSU, and NRCS. So covering research, education, and implementation. So kudos to the team for all that they have accomplished. So not to belabor this any longer, uh, please enjoy the friendly atmosphere and the relaxed environment. I hope you have a great learning experience and fulfilling time during your stay. Well, thanks again for coming to North Dakota. We're glad to have you and enjoy your stay. Thank you. All right, so which mic works better? 
Does it matter? <laughs> All right. What's that? So our, our, our next speaker is uh, uh, Dr. Dave Hopkins. He's going to uh, welcome us from NDSU. Dr. Hopkins uh, has did some initial mapping in eastern uh, Montana, and he's been our uh, soil genesis instructor, intro to soils instructor at NDSU for, for several years. He, I don't know that he's, um, conti I think, Dr. DeSutter also teaches Intro to Soils now too. Um, but uh, um, with that, I'll, I'll bring Dr. Hopkins up here and, and most of the information, I'm not gonna sit and read everybody's um, bio um, and bore you with that, that all day long. So, because um, that's all there for you. And, and we'll bring Dr. Hopkins up here. Okay. I think there's a pointer here. Uh, there is a pointer. It's <laughs> That's okay. That's okay. I'll just the red button. Which one? Is the red button is too small. Too small, too tiny. Uh, good morning, everybody. Um, uh, it's, it's great to see you all here, um, especially looking over the Missouri like this. So it's a privilege to welcome you in a different sense to, to the state of North Dakota and the, and the National Soil Survey Conference of 2023. Um, those of you that are joining us virtually, um, we do have folks that are going to be monitoring the chats and things like that, so we want you to engage as much as you can and, and join, in the, um, join in the conference in this respect and, and contribute uh, all you can. This morning, uh, i got to pay attention to this thing too. Uh, this morning I'd like to um, begin this talk with uh, some aspects of North Dakota's landforms and soils, and specifically its, its uh, pedology history. So I'm going to do this with a metaphor of three trains, okay? Three trains across this state, and simplistically we'll look at diversity of soils and early soil survey history. Um, we'll look at uh, something exciting in the air, the train was not called that, and then spreading soil knowledge. Uh, and the train wasn't called that either, but nevertheless. So if I can make this thing work, very good. So uh, after, the, after the first World's Fair in, 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 in Chicago in, in 1893, um, many of you know about that, but one thing you may not know is, is that eight train cars got, got together with representatives from 27 countries and took people all the way up to a little village of Laramore, North Dakota, which is west of Grand Forks. They picked up some news people in Minneapolis on the way for the trip. And what did they do at the farm? What was the, what was the story? The story was that they had 42 uh, bundle, bundle units with three mules each and one driver. And before noon, they harvested and bundled 160 acres of spring wheat. It's pretty amazing. And so imagine what that was like for the people uh, that were there. This is an interesting cartoon of one of the uh, passenger agents uh, taking, them up to the, taking them up to that farm. The t it may have looked something like this, of course, with higher grain. Uh, this was from the Dalrymple Farm in Castleton, North Dakota. Some of our very best soils, um, five governors. Um, and uh, so you can get some sense of that. So after this exhibition of agricultural productivity and technological prowess, um, they sat down under a big tent and had, a, had lunch with prairie chickens and all the fixings, so that was pretty cool. Um, so what was going on? Why, why, why all this interest in our area? Of course, we'd already had a wave of immigrants coming through. Um, we had the Homestead Act, we had free land, we had, we had the railroad monopolies doing everything they could to move grain out, move people in, advertise, those sorts of things. And we had marketers like Max Bass, who was actually born in Vienna, but he, he was an immigration agent for the railroads, or for the Dakota Territories, I should say, the Dakota Territories. And then later on, from about 1890 to 1915 or something like that, he um, would go back east uh, on trains to lure to lure settlers from the eastern states to come to North Dakota. That's, so this guy was quite the impresario. Um, 
And so, um, so this is Max Bass. And so our historian Robinson says that during this period from about 1898, I think I'm getting the numbers right, to 1915, a quarter million people swelled into this state to take land and to, and to increase all of the various and sundry aspects of economy that allowed, uh, allowed this state to become what it has become. Um, so what was, going on, uh, what was going on at the newly formed North Dakota Agricultural College at that time? Well, our first president was Stockbridge. We've always, um, we've always uh, highlighted soils here at the, at the university. Um, he was an expert on soils, apparently, and published this book. I love it, Rocks and Soils. I would have taught that in intro. Um, uh, and it was published by Wiley. So um, what, did that, what did that group do? What did that group do? Well, this is one of the things they did. They had teams of soil scientists working with the USGS, and they put out this 1902 map of the geologic and economic map of North Dakota. And I want to highlight a couple aspects of this map. We'll move slowly, well, rapidly, through the, uh, through the physiographic provinces that you see here. But on the, on the east side in the Red River Valley, I want to just highlight that, that there it says something along the lines of 9 million acres. 9 million acres of the richest soil in America, the Nile of the Western Hemisphere. It's a pretty, it's a pretty exciting little, little story. So uh, let's just take a peek at a few aspects of the soils across, across this landscape. Um, this is the Lake Agassiz Plain. Locally, we, of course, call it the Red River Valley, uh, quite the misnomer. Um, and we, here you see the two major, uh, the major um, formations of, of, the, of, of, the, of the Lake Agassiz Plain. This is from South Dakota border all the way up north of Winnipeg. So the Chirac Formation is the parent material to the left, the buff-colored calcareous, um, calcareous uh, silty clay, 50 52% clay, and the rest is silt, 1% um, sand. And then the Brenna, which is causing the horrible engineering problems, a fat clay that goes down 100 feet, and it's deeper at Grand Forks, it's deeper as you go north. Um, so Fargo's been called a city on stilts, uh, because all of our buildings that are tall, of course, have to go all the way down to either firm till or below the bottom of the lake sediments to rock. Um, so anyway, this is, so, and this, is what, this is what this material looks like. I'm going to come back to this uh, varved clay. This is the parent material of that 9 million acres of the richest soil in, uh, in the Western Hemisphere. You can see the varves very, very easily. And again, we'll come back to that. Um, so this phenomenal confluence of prairie vegetation, microbial decomposers, and the entirety of the Holocene have provided this amazing soil that uh, you know is in the Red River Valley. Um, you know, you're welcome to come back, especially after a two-inch, three-day rain. Um, as we move to the west, as we move to the west, we end up on the Till Plain, of course. And here we see an early um, uh, Wells County Soil Survey uh, block diagram of, of one of the breadbasket soil landscapes, the Barn Svea. Um, tremendously productive land. These soils are. It, it, Product, spring break productivity of 85, um, three is higher, wonderful soils, okay? There's a story there. Um, and here, Andy Andall told it well in his book, The Soils of the Great Plains. This is a beautiful picture to me that shows the promise of this landscape and the agricultural productivity that's found all the way across the till plain. Now, there's obviously soils within there that are problematic, but nevertheless. Uh, the soils of the Coteau, here we have moraines and steep slopes, lots of rocks, high energy, high energy uh, depositional systems, of course, and uh, um, the Coteau, you know, the Coteau, much of the Coteau, you know, should be still in grass, to be honest with you, uh, but nevertheless, Robinson said this about some of the settlers, because there's pockets, of course, of land that are pretty questionable. He said the country was filled with people who did not understand it very well. Um, and that is, that is certainly true, historically. Yesterday, the Sunday tour people, of course, we got to see some of this West River, West River country. This is, uh, we didn't see this particular butte. This is way down south, but um, ancient, ancient landscapes. No, no quaternary glaciation. Um, uh, up on those buttes, we've got, we've got Miocene, we've got Miocene materials and, and paleosols that you wouldn't believe. Paralithic beds that we saw yesterday up at the Seine Pit. Um, Cretaceous shales that are both alkaline and acidic and some very good soils, especially considering, you know, this is eustic, dry eustic, moving into small areas of the aridic soil moisture regime, lots of, lots of lignite. So back to that 1902 map, what else was going on in North Dakota at the time? 
1908, the first major soil survey that was mandated by Congress to map soils west of the 100th meridian was done, and that was this. Five-sixths of the area of New York State was this initial map, and who was the party leader was Macy Lapham, and some of you older folks know about the book Crisscross Trails. Uh, associated with him was Thomas Rice, uh, uh, George Coffey, famous soil scientists of the day who went on to important um, historical roles in soil survey in our, in our nation, no question about it. Uh, just a little bit later, a noble et al. did the, uh, the Cass County, and Fargo's the county seat, of course, of Cass County, did the uh, Cass County Soil Survey, and this image is really neat. Um, was printed in a British soils text uh, by, by Ro another gentleman named Robinson, and it moved across the English-speaking world in terms of education. And just think about that. This was the exemplar Black Earth or Chernozem for the English-speaking world at the university level, and it came from Cass County, North Dakota. And then later, Kellogg actually put the same, uh, same image in, in one of his books. So this is Western Cass, where we have the till plain in, in Cass County. Um, and that basically brings us to the second train, the second train. So something exciting is happening in uh, something exciting. That's the name of this train. 1927, that, that was a 1924 soil survey. Um, uh, in 1924, the International Congress was formed in Rome of soil scientists. And then in 1927, of course, we had the International Congress meeting in Washington with representatives from the whole world. And they got on the great transcontinental excursion. They went clockwise around all the way up to Edmonton, started, you know, started across the southern plains, and then they ended up at Fargo as well. So here, here we see a picture, forgive me, of uh, one of the excursions in Fargo. And there we see Curtis Fletcher Marbot. Okay, the lion of soil survey of the first several decades of the, of, the, of, the, uh, of the 19th century, you know, until he passed away in China doing soils work. And there he is standing on the beach. And to me, this picture is absolutely, shows the excitement and the need and the desire to learn more about soils. I think it's palpable in this image. I, I love it. Um, and so, so something exciting is in the air, and here's one of the exciting things that happened in this state. Uh, in 1929, Charles Kellogg comes from his fresh PhD and is here for a short period of time, five years, but he has this academic rigor that he, that he is known for, and I've talked to people that actually left NDAC before he came and said he was known for instilling great loyalty in his students and things like that. It's just really remarkable. Um, when I was in a Genesis class, Dr. Nielsen at, at Bozeman gave us a reading list of what Kellogg suggested for his students, and it was like, is this an English class? Is this a philosophy class? Or I'm in agriculture. It was incredible. Um, and so you can read about that. I think Roy Simonson's got an article about that, uh, uh, some of that sort of thing, in the early teaching of the Duke of Chaya factors. He was the second one in our nation to teach it. And I just met a gentleman from Oklahoma, and you guys were the first. So of the land-grant universities, Oklahoma began teaching the Duke of Chaya factors of soil formation, and, and Kellogg was second. Um, in a, in, so he was noted for rigor. In this letter from Veach, uh, I think his field was soil fertility at Michigan State University, he, uh, Kellogg had written to him about some lab standards that he wanted to use for his students in the labs, color standards. And Veach writes back and he says, your questions are interesting, but aren't you placing too great, too great a burden on the poor student? He said, I can't answer them myself. He says, can you? It's kind of interesting. And so, so who are these poor students? Who are these poor students that were, you know, just, you know, had this rigorous teacher? Folks, here we have luminaries of the American Soil Survey Program that studied with Kellogg. It's absolutely amazing. I wonder if I can make this miserable thing work. This is, this is uh, Marlon Klein, who goes on to earn his PhD and become a professor of soil science and pedology at Cornell. This is Andy Andall, whose picture I just showed you in the book. Clint Mogan came over and visited us in Bozeman and would go on field trips with us. He was the correlator of the Dakotas and Montana for the SCS. Um, here we have, of course, Roy, uh, Roy Simonson right in the middle staring out. What can you say about Roy Simonson? Okay, and who's this guy with a smirk on his face? That's Johnsgaard. Well, it turns out, folks, it turns out that Johnsgaard was, uh, in, the, in the obituary written by the university, it said he graduated from NDAC in 1934, student of Kellogg, majoring in soils with one of the highest scholastic records ever attained in the College of Agriculture at NDSU. So this is John's guard. And so here we introduce the conductor of the third train. Okay? 
So he comes, he goes, goes to the war, comes back in 46 after, his, uh, after he's earned his, his, uh, his uh, doctorate at Cornell, he comes back in 46, and somehow in his mind something was, something was clicking. And here we see the Mouse River Press, that's way up in McHenry County. It's, it's interesting, it's a, it's a crappy image that I pulled off the web, but outstanding exhibits included in the soils train. I started, I, I, escaped, I escaped eastern Montana uh, <laughs> mapping in Carter and Fallon counties, and I did irrigation soil surveys on the, on the Middle Soros and the Mouse River irrigation districts. So for me, this, this kind of hits home. So the great NDAC soil special came up in his head, okay? And so, sorry, so what did that look like? It looked like this. And it went to 48 communities and cities in this, in this state. And it had four cars with exhibits. It's absolutely fantastic. And so to me, when I think, and I think about this, especially with the younger people in this crowd, all of us, what was the first stop? The first stop was Hope, North Dakota. That was the first stop, Hope. And so inside the train, what did we have? Here's the little brochure that was given to farmers, know your soils. It looks like an old Monopoly game um, card. Um, and inside, of course, were all sorts of exhibits, absolutely remarkable exhibits. Um, folks, I got to tell you, I taught 210 for 14 years and 15 semesters, and this little block of granite was sitting in one of the cabinets in the back of the room, and I always thought, I wonder who got that rock? I know who got that rock. Uh, besides that were the soils of North Dakota on these monoliths. Um, the Bearden is one of our one of our incredibly productive beet soils. It's, it's tremendously productive soil. And then the great soils of the, of the, of the Till Plain barns, the breadbasket that I talked about, the Williams for the western part of the state, and the Morton. And on the high pit that I was at yesterday, for those of you who were there, that sand was sort of like equivalent to a moderately deep Morton to some degree. So these, this is what the farmers were seeing. Picture the excitement in the, picture the excitement in, you know, in Dickinson, okay? Picture the excitement in Dickinson when the train was rolling into town in 1952. It's just really a pretty amazing story. Um, and again, 48 communities were, were hit this way. So, so this image that we're about to see here fell into my lap. It's amazing what they want to throw away at universities. It's just amazing. And so this fell into my lap, and I kept it from the trash can. And I loved this image. I didn't know who these people were. And to me, it, it, it absolutely says, you got an agricultural problem? We can fix it. Let's learn something. Let's get out there and fix it. And so here we have, here we have Jensen, we have Dietrich in the middle, and we have Virgil, Virgil Weiser there. Well, what I learned in preparing this talk was that these two gentlemen over on the right were members of that soils train doing the extension work in those 48 counties. How cool is that? And these are the kinds of people that were out there um, d doing, doing this outreach. It's just remarkable. Um, those that are regional, uh, Virgil Weiser was Hal, is Hal Weiser's uncle. And of course, Hal Weiser is now our retired soil health specialist uh, from many decades in North Dakota. So I just want to tell you these guys knew how to have fun. Okay? They knew how to have fun. There's no question about it. Uh, so, so I want you to know that, but, but, I, but there's a part of this that's true. There was, this was a strong guild of people that were pushing soils in our state. And so in terms of the, in terms of the names, this doesn't mean much to some of you, and, and forgive me for this, but I mean, this gentleman right here hired me, okay? Leo Anderson, he really wants to know something about the photographer, clearly. Enoch Norum, Enoch Norum is back here. He was at our department chair for many years. McClelland is legendary. He went up in, into high levels as, as a correlator in the SCS. Volkerding was assistant. And there's, of course, Roy Simonson from Agate, this little village. And there's our Dean Walster, and John Scard is over here hiding behind Clint Mogan's head. And Clint used to come to Bozeman and take us students a few times on field trips. And I remember seeing this old man going, why is he so excited about this? He's so damned old. And he'd crumble the, he'd crumble the beautiful Amsterdam silt loam in his hands. It's pretty amazing. So um, more seriously, though, more seriously, though, the conclusion here is the memory, the soil scientist. This memory is a soil scientist forming factor. And what I want to share here with you all is the idea that for all of us, for all of us in this room, our recollections sometimes can become blurred. 
or they can become buried. And it's important, I think, to reflect upon where we came from, how we entered this discipline, and who some of the people were that helped us move along, recognizing this is a career that's worth something. And societally, of course, it is. So I hope, I hope you know that I truly believe each of our states has a remarkable pedagogic history. I just don't know it. Uh, I, you know, it'd be fun. You know it. So this soil survey legacy that we have, um, hopefully, as we celebrate this, um, it'll lead to a greater appreciation of, of, of this precious resource that we have. Um, and oh, 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 that's just so nice. This is just like a soils lecture. OK, I promise, OK? This is the, these are these young people. This is just a couple examples. You all have the same sort of, sort of story with inter, people that you interacted with that keep coming back to you at an extension fair and asking you another question. Mike's learning how. He's working, uh, he's working with a Minnesota Pollution Control Agency. And here he was helping me sample for the geochemical initiative in the early 2000s. Brianna Wade took this wonderful picture of Brianna helping. And you're going to be on this very site. You're going to see thin sections from this very site. But look at that woman's face. These things come in our head and are part of who we are. And I think that's an important, an important aspect of this. So, so I'm going to bed one day with my wife in the 80s, late 80s. And I get a call like at 9.30 or 10 o'clock or 11. And it's my department chair. I'm not used to calls from my department chair. And Lynn Brun says, David, there's a couple of Russians that are coming into town tomorrow. Could you spend a bit of time with them and show them some things? I said, darn right I can. Okay, okay, preface to the story. I grew up in the 60s. I bent over under the desk because of the great bomb that was going to be coming. What was my sense of Russia in that sense as a young person? <laughs> this totalitarian, atheistic society. So I meet Anna Pashtyakova, the, the translator, and I re meet Professor Kira Yushkin. And we go out and we look at soils in the area, and I take him up to County 20, and we look at the Fargo. And this guy is older than I, by sure, and he's got a big, long, black coat on, and scary. Takes his coat off. <laughs> I hand him the shovel. I said, this is just really an honor, because I knew a little bit about Russian, Russian uh, pedology history. And he dug a hole that could hold three full basketballs. OK, you can do that in a coarse silty. You can do that in a, in a sandy. But to do it in a Fargo clay, it's a lot of work. And so he, he digs that thing out, and then he picks the soil up. He asks me questions, about 17% of which I probably answered reasonably well. And, uh, you know, because Russia was always big on chemistry. And so uh, this was an interesting aspect of it. Then he picks this stuff up, and he looks back at me, and he said, he said these soils are a gift of God. <laughs> And they are. So, so welcome to North Dakota. Uh, and I'd like to say that to you all. OK. Thank you, Dr. Hopkins. I, I enjoy your enthusiasm. I <laughs> just always admire that. Thank you. Next, we have uh, some remarks from the Soil Science or Society of America. And, and uh, Dr. Kerry Lebowski is with us. Kerry is um, a research leader at the Pasture Systems and Watershed Management uh, Research Unit in University Park. Pennsylvania with, with the Ag Research Service. And so without further ado, Carrie. Good morning, everyone. A little bit louder. Good morning. All right, thank you. It's hard to follow Dr. Hopkins, OK? So <clears throat> I've heard about him, and now I've seen it. So this is great. So just a few things I want to, oh, are my slides up here? Let's see what we get. How do we advance here? It's not, am I not pointing at the right thing? All right, well, I'll start and we'll catch up. I don't have too many slides. So, <clears throat> as I said, how do you follow that? But this was a, a great, 
uh, start. Yesterday was a phenomenal field day. It's been a long time since I've been on a field day like that. Um, all right, that's great. By training, I'm more of a, a soil fertility nutrient management person, uh, but I really appreciate being able to get out in the pits, look at soil, and, and interact with all of you that think about the pedagogical processes that are happening, um, because that helps me think about how do we manage these soils better, too. And so from SSSA standpoint, I just want to give you a few highlights of things that we've been uh, working on and then ask for, for your help uh, as well as we move forward together. Oh, but before I start that, I just want to, uh, you know, tell everybody or remind you, some of you may know, the mission of the SSSA is advancing knowledge and appreciation of soils as the foundation of life. And I think that that's what we're all about here. How do we... Uh, you know, whether it's human life, uh, any, any sort of life on this planet and our planet as a whole. Uh, how do we continue moving forward? And one of the things that uh, SSSA has been working on recently is uh, more diversity. And I am representing that with our I Heart Soil stickers. We have a whole bunch. They're wildly popular. Uh, I brought some along. They're back out on the recruitment table, so get them while you can. Uh, I don't have, didn't have the full diversity of them. But we've been working hard in this uh, uh, realm over the past few years, trying to make uh, our meetings uh, more inclusive. What can we do that makes it uh, easier for people to attend? Uh, you know, if there's, you know, barriers for attending or participating. Uh, we've added on to the board of directors uh, a DEI a member at large uh, to help us always be uh, reflecting on that. How, how do we improve the diversity of our uh, members. And I think that's really important because diversity of perspective helps us make better decisions in moving forward. And I, I have always thought that you know, more heads are usually better than one when trying to uh, you know, move forward and, and make decisions. And so with that, I want to move on to another initiative that we've been working on. Uh, last, uh, late last summer, last fall, we rolled out uh, Decode 6. And this is a really interesting uh, platform. It is uh, talking about decoding carbon and ecosystem services. And it, there's a website for it. You're invited to all uh, you know, visit it. And what it is is we're looking to have an educational platform because we found that there was a lot of uh, questions that producers and others had about uh, carbon markets, ecosystem services, what are they, how do they work, uh, is this really a good thing for my farm operation, um, you know, all of that. And so it really is SSSA serving as an aggregator of information and a delivery platform for that and it's built on sound scientific uh, information. And so on the website you're going to find short articles, videos, podcasts, uh, talking about a range of things uh, related to, to carbon and ecosystem services. And so basically, if you have a question, ask it. We may be able to have an answer already on the website. Uh, and if we don't, that, that'll be a topic that gets added in in the future. And so this is a joint project that SSSA has with uh, American Society of Agronomy and Crop Science Society of America. And you know, it's still largely in its infancy. Like I said, it's not quite a year old yet, but it has a lot of opportunity. And so if you want to know more, go to the website, uh, come talk to me if you have ideas about it. Um, we'd love to hear from everybody and find out you know, what uses people may have for it that we hadn't thought about uh, before. And just a, a little bit of a you know, promotional here, uh, remind folks that our fall annual meeting is coming up October 29th and November 1st. We're going to be in uh, Missouri and we're going to be celebrating the Trailblazers. Uh, in St. Louis, and so there'll be a lot of uh, good uh, miscellaneous tours, talks, you know, the usual that we have going on there. But what I think is more exciting, and I think this group will find it uh, very exciting, is June of 2024, SSSA is planning a special conference in San Juan, Puerto Rico. And so it's going to be a smaller conference. It's going to be very different. You know, the annual meeting, many of you have probably attended. It's big. There's thousands of people there. This is going to be a small meeting. About 400 people is about the maximum that our venue will be able to hold. Uh, it's going to be a different format. Uh, we're going to have uh, invited talks only, 
And we've got four of our uh, invited speakers already lined up here. I want to uh, call out uh, Manuel. Where did he go? I was talking to him earlier today. He's helping. Uh, he's going to lead off uh, some of the discussion with soils of, of Puerto Rico. Uh, we're going to have a number of uh, tours as well, uh, probably about eight different tours, uh, looking at maybe four on Sunday and four on Thursday after it, uh, the conference is over. And when I say different, it's going to be invited speakers and posters will be volunteered. So that's very different than our annual meeting for those of you that normally attend. And we're going to have daily themes. And so we'll have a few uh, kind of keynote speakers each day uh, related to the theme. And, the, and then we're going to have workshops and things like that. So uh, the themes are soils across, uh, I can't read from that far, scales. Uh, soils across communities and soils across uh, disciplines. So really thinking about pushing the boundaries of soil and, and making a bigger tent for soil science and bringing more people into the tent. Because we have a lot of folks that do soil science and other disciplines that we interact with, but let's bring them into our tent. And so this is going to be a, a really uh, neat opportunity uh, and should be a, just a great trip. Um, it's, we've been planning it already for a year and a half, and we still have about a year to go. And so that you can tell there's a lot of effort uh, going into that. And so just thank all the planning committee members uh, for their help so far. Now, this is something I'm going to ask you. Um, you know, we don't have time for you to respond right now, but while I'm here for the rest of the day, uh, I would like to talk with folks. We have a board of directors meeting uh, coming up uh, at the end of this month, and dedicated to strategic planning. And uh, what we need to do is, you know, think about what's our vision for where we're uh, going. And so some things that are on my radar, uh, and that's not necessarily the, the whole board, I mean, I'm just the president, but there's a whole board, but things that are on my radar that I think we need to be thinking about for strategic planning, and this is where I want input from, from all of you, is the pipeline of future soil scientists. We've got some issues there. How, how, do we, how do we work on that? Uh, funding for soil science uh, research, whether that's uh, you know, soil science or soil use and management type of research. Uh, we need to, in my opinion, increase our engagement with the practicing professionals. We don't always have them uh, working together with us very much within SSSA. We need to do a better job. And then broadening the soil stakeholder uh, group. You know, we have a lot of people in this country that are water stakeholders, right? You know, they ad identify. They might pay $50 to some association to be a member for a water stakeholder. But how many people do we have that are soil stakeholders? We should have every single person in this country, right? Life depends on soil. And so those are some things that are on my radar. Um, you may have some other ones that you think that are really important for us. And I'd like to, to hear about them. And I'd like to hear about what do you think we're doing well? What can we be doing better or should we be doing differently? Um, and this is a great time. Um, and I already got picked some brains yesterday. Um, really good to hear from different folks to get perspective. And so it's kind of uh, feeding into all of that. So uh, that's all I have. My contact information's there. Uh, really easy, carrie.loboski at usda.gov. Um, you don't have to, it's not the big Lebowski or anything, it's just Carrie <laughs> Lebowski. So, although I should see if they'll give me that email address too. All right, thank you very much, and I hope everybody enjoys their time here. Thank you. Next, next we have, have with us is Dr. Louis Tupa, who is he's our uh, uh, Deputy Chief for Soil Science and Resource Assessment. Um, um, and he's, he's going to bring some remarks from, uh, from SSRA um, from, to the conference. So there you are. Tend to be 
Yeah, podiums tend to be tall. <laughs> so thank you very much. First, um, I'd really like to thank the organizers of this meeting. You've given us a great opportunity to be together again after three long years. So thank you, Wade. Thank you, Dr. Hopkins. And Dr. Hopkins, I am so happy to see that part of the welcoming remarks is a science talk and history lesson. So you don't usually get to see that in a lot of these gatherings where you, know, you get to the business right away and start talking about science. And um, I was also told that uh, there are many new people to this uh, NCSS organization, young people, people new to the profession. And for them and for all of us here, I'd just like to remind us what, what is the NCSS. And on your website, it says, the National Cooperative Soil Survey is a nationwide partnership of federal, regional, state, and local agencies and private entities and institutions. That's pretty much everyone on this earth. <laughs> because if you look further down, who can join? Anyone can join. <laughs> now that's amazing. But more importantly, this, it says that the partnership works to cooperatively investigate, inventory, document, classify, interpret, disseminate, and publish information about soils. That's also a lot. That's also a big responsibility. And the thoughts that uh, Dr. Lebowski just presented about the pipeline, where we're going, those are also on the mind of the agency. We need professionals. We need to know where we're going. We need to open up the doors of science in many areas to what we're doing right now. Uh, but first, before I continue, I'd like the NRCS or USDA employees to please stand up. Wow. Well, thank you for your service. Thank you for doing what you're doing. It's important. The mission needs all of you. Thank you very much. Thank you. And the non USDA employees, please stand up. Yeah, I know you're not that many, but <laughs> thank you for your partnership. Thank you for your collaboration. Okay. We need each other here. And like what I read a while ago, anyone can join. It's because what we're studying is very fundamental to what feeds this country. Um, There's a story I heard, uh, I, I think a former Secretary of Agriculture once asked a group of, um, an audience he was talking to, who, who of you in this audience are involved with agriculture? Well, a few people raised their hands. Really, who has anything to do with agriculture here? A few more people raised their hands. Then the next one was, who's going to have dinner tonight? <laughs> Everybody raised their hands. Well, all of you are involved in this agricultural enterprise that we have. And that's fundamental to what we're doing here. NRCS has been described as an agency that can do things. And I'll tell you a consequence of that. But first, the reason why it's important for all of us to be engaged in what we're doing in partnership with everybody out there is because the economy, the prosperity of this country is dependent on the soil and its properties. That includes its water, that includes its fertility, that includes its microorganisms, its, phys its physical, chemical, and biological state. And we're in the business of not just surveying that, we're in the business of studying that, we're in the business of communicating that, and we're in the business of helping people help the land. That's what NRCS is all about. So I'd like to encourage all of you to please continue doing what you need to do so that we can help others. 
Now, what's on the NRCS agenda? Well, the new administration, when it came in, and Terry Cosby became the chief of NRCS, there were three things that he wanted us to focus on. Climate, diversity, equity, and inclusion, and urban agriculture. That's what we're going to deal with. And we're all going to deal with it in a scientific manner. We are the science base of NRCS. Without us, they can't do conservation planning. Without us, they don't understand what's out there. And I'm just so inspired by looking outside that window. It's beautiful. Let's keep it that way. We have to know what's going on, and we have to understand how are we going to face the challenges. July 3rd was the third hottest recorded temperature of this planet. It happened. What does that mean to us? Oh yeah, it was a hot day. We have air conditioning. We can go to a, a movie theater or a swimming pool and cool down. But what does that mean to the environment when it gets that hot? What does it mean to the soil? What does it mean to the productivity of the land? There are consequences to that very, very hot day. We can understand what caused it. There's an El Nino that's developing, plus all the other things that are going on with climate change. But there are consequences to that heat. And that's our job. Our job is to find out what are those consequences for the future? What shall we be doing about it? What happens when the next warmest day in, a, in the planet comes? Are we prepared for that? So we must always look towards the things that we can do. So the other new thing that has come about from the agency, and it came through legislation, is $18.5 billion that the states have to spend until 2031 to help mitigate greenhouse gas. So we're not just in the business now of understanding soil, but we're also in the business now of being able to sequester or reduce greenhouse gas emissions from all that's taking place right now. So that's part of also the, the new things that we have to do. And that's why they gave it to NRCS. We are the agency that can get things done. So, as the deputy chief of the Soil Science and Resource Assessment, when I got this, when I came into this job in 2000, uh, one of the questions that then um, uh, Chief Matt Lore asked me is, how are you going to manage a group of people all over the country? And I said, we'll do it through the chain of command. That was pretty much like an obvious answer. I didn't realize how expansive we were when I got the job, when I realized I have 750 employees all over the country. Except probably for California and or Texas, we're the third biggest state, the deputy area. And I have everyone from the Pacific Islands to the, to the Caribbean. So I have email arriving, Sometimes at 9 p.m., Louis, I need this, please sign off. And as long as I don't go to jail, I'll sign it. Okay? <laughs> I have the privilege of being the allowance holder and owner of a fleet of boats that Greg Taylor here operates. <laughs> Where's Greg? Keep them safe. <laughs> keep them well maintained. I have also almost a construction company of bulldozers, trucks, refrigerated vans. You know, I'm no longer scared when I see something, uh, a purchase order for a million dollars for an airboat. Uh, Greg, I signed that. <laughs> but I worry. We're a great enterprise together. We're a big group that can get things done. 
And one of the things I was reading about in the history of the NCSS is that if it wasn't for the NCSS in 1896, the Department of, uh, not Department, the Division of Agriculture Soils was formerly under the USDA Weather Bureau. And it was because of NCSS that it became its own division in the department, and that's what led us to become the Soil Conservation Service and now NRCS. But NCSS was the driving force that separated us from a, another organization, and now we are an independent organization as an agency. That's our strength. Together, we are strong. Imagine an organization as big as this, and if, if uh, Carrie, how many did you say are members of the SSSA? 4,000? Something like that? That's just SSSA. It's one of our partner organizations. Okay? But look at all, all of us here, who we represent. We're part of this bigger group of people that can get things done. Let's get things done. And now we have to look at climate change. We have to look at greenhouse gases. We have to look at climate adaptation. We have to look at our, uh, at our conservation practices and look at them not only as a means to address soil issues, but also now to address climate issues. That's a big jump. And we have to make sure that we make that thing rigorous. So we need each other. Uh, I joined NRCS in 2020. Prior to that, I was with the National Institute of Food and Agriculture. So my partners then were the land-grant universities. I knew the deans, I knew the presidents, I knew the directors of the ag experiment stations, I knew the directors of extension. Great partners. They're part of this organization. Let's continue to work with them. Okay. Our fi my final thought, and this is also um, a priority of the agency is your wellness. Take care of yourselves, please. Take the time to rest. Take the time to relax and be, you know, enjoy life. Our jobs can be stressful, not just physically, but also mentally stressful. So we need to be well in order for us to do our work and in order for us to take care of others, not just our family and our friends and our communities, but those who depend upon us. For those of you who have leadership roles, you need to be well in order for you to take care of those who work for you. It's important. So please take care of yourselves so you can help others. I will be here until Wednesday, and if you'd like to chat, tell me what's on your mind, let me know what's going on. You know, give me your thoughts, positive or negative, about how things are going. I need to know those things. And I'm, I'm not afraid of bad news. Because bad news can always be corrected. So let me know what's on your mind as well. You can reach me by email through any one of the NRCS employees. Let them know, uh, how do I get in touch with Louis? No problem. I will respond. So. Let's work together. Let's work together as one organization that can get things done. There's a big future ahead of all of us with regards to the science that we can produce, the communications that we have, so that other people can realize that there is a better future out there for all of us. So, thank you very much. Have a good day. Thank you, Louie. Appreciate your, your, your comments. Next, next on our agenda is... Oh, look. let's get your slides up there, Dr. Lou. Just hang tight. We'll get your slides.
we're ahead of schedule. I used to work for extension. I can fill any time you give me. Let's, 
and bring it back in, please. Let's bring it back in, please. Thanks. Let's bring it back in so that we can stay on schedule, please. We are way ahead of schedule, but... All right, folks, let's sit, let's sit her down and let's get rolling here. We got a couple of announcements for you. If you came in late and you have not registered yet, registration is to my right in room 432. Those of you that have posters, I need those of you that brought posters to take your posters to room 432, please. And then, then our crew will take them over to the Gateway to Science tomorrow and get them hung for you. All right, we're going to get back into our program. Next, next on, on our agenda, we have comments from uh, the Soil and Plant Science Division leadership. And so, Dr. Limbo, welcome. So, which one do you want? All right, thanks, everyone. Um, again, plenty of time to discuss. The good thing is, as I said, I can fill any time, so the break will occur at 9.30. So that's a, that's a great thing. Um, Dr. Tupas set me up really well with some of the uh, comments that he made, and it kind of fits in with the title of my talk. It's a great time to be a scientist. Now, I did this talk for the Soil Science, or something like this talk for the Soil Science Society of North Carolina. Because it was a soil science group, I put the word soil scientist in there. But I want to recognize we are not all soil scientists in this room. And within the division, within NRCS, there's a lot of folks that are not soil scientists. They still are part of what we do. They're important. They're all scientists. And within the division, everyone is a scientist. That's what we do. So it's not, don't put yourself in a box and say you're a soil scientist. You're a scientist. Remember that. So let's talk about why at least I see this as a great time to be a scientist. Start with priorities. All right, I asked this at a different conference earlier. For the folks in the division or for the folks that are within CSS, we send out the priorities every year through our weekly update. You all see them for the division. Okay, audience participation time. I know you're like, oh no. You hated it when professors used to do that, right? All right, who can name one of the priorities for the division? Raise your hand. Okay, that's great. All right, Dave Hoover. Okay. <laughs> so, so I, I, again, one of my direct reports, you know, has to be first. So, Dave, what is one priority? Partnerships. Partnerships, right. So one of our priorities is partnerships. All right, Dave gets paid this week. 
somebody else. What is one of our other priorities? Oh, come on. I send this out every year. Urban. Urban. Not exactly, but, but partially. All right, so you, you get paid for half of the week. <laughs> Wade. Dynamics also not quite. You don't get paid because you're not on my staff. <laughs> All right, somebody else. Come on, folks. And, and, and again, I point this out because we send this out every year. And then every year I get the comment, we don't know what our, your priorities are. Well, anyhow, so. Also partially correct. <laughs> Parti I'm sorry, it's partially correct. All right, go. Also partially correct. Was, was that? Partially correct. All right, so we're getting there. Does anybody, uh, we'll go give it one more shot. Recruitment, also partially correct. <laughs> These are all priorities, I mean, these are all good things. But priorities are big, big picture stuff. So, our priority is survey. Yes, it includes dynamic soul survey, if I can get this, oh, doesn't work, okay. It does include dynamic soul survey, it does include inventory, all aspects of inventory, not just initial, not just urban. It includes ecological sites, so your ecological sites, like I said, partial, and dynamic soil properties, but it's all part of the survey that we do, providing the information that helps the conservation planners, the land use planners, anybody who's dealing with soils. That's part of what we do. Then we have the soil services and information. That's the technical soil services. That's part of it, but it's also disseminating that information to whoever wants it. Again, we are the group that has the, the authoritative soils data. And then finally, the partnerships through the Na National Cooperative Soil Survey, but other partners as well. But as Dr. Tupas pointed out, NRCS and USDA also has priorities. And we always get this comment, your priorities are in conflict. I can't do my job if, my, if the priorities are in conflict. Has anybody ever said that? Heard that? Maybe? Yes? All right. So are these priorities in conflict? What do you think? It all depends on what spin doctor you end up employing. And we have some good ones. So we do climate. We're going to look at, we're doing soil carbon. Everybody here remember RACA in a good way? <laughs> in a good way. It was a great thing. So I was at NC State when it went on, and I, it was a wonderful program for us. You know, we were able to partnership, it was, had a great partnership with NRCS. SCAN, Soil Climate Analysis Network, is part of what we're doing, and it adds information to climate. It's something that can be used to understand what climate is doing, how we can work with it. Our Coastal Zone Group has been looking at climate in regards to the increase or the rise in sea level and some of the issues there with salinization. So that's part of the climate. Dynamic soil properties just by their name relates to climate. They, soil properties do change in a human time scale. We need to document it, not only for what we do to them, but what is climate doing? How is that changing? State and transition models with the ecological sites, understanding how those integrate and can be affected as climate changes. Uh, folks in North Dakota, what year did you start growing corn in North Dakota? Was it 1940? Was it 1980? More recent? 70s. 70s? And again, and again, you ask, is that Corn Belt moving north? Is that has something to do with climate? Does that have something to do with the state and transition that we're looking at? I hope so. And that gets to the last one, the plant distribution changes. Our uh, folks in the plants group are looking at that and documenting how different species are changing and moving over time. So we, uh, we are doing climate as part of what we do. So we are, we are indeed have climate as a priority. What about diversity and equity? Are we doing that? Again, everybody in the division should be nodding their head, yes, okay. 
We are continuing recruitment. So who said recruitment is an important thing? Right, it is. It is absolutely important that we continue to recruit. More on that later, and I think we have a discussion on Thursday about recruitment, or is it what? At some point we do Thursday. So again, very important to understand. We're expanding our connections with the 1890 schools, with the, with the um, uh, HSI inst institutions as well. So these are expansions, getting those connections, improving what, we, what we've had. Surveys that are going on in Alaska as one location, that's just one example with native corporations. We are going to map the country in the next three years. These corporations are critical for partners for us. And environmental surveys that are being done, that are being done at the request of individuals. So we are working with diversity and equity wherever possible. And of course, there's urban. Um, as I understand it, Randy, we just got a call or a question from Baltimore to redo their, their soil survey, which was done in 1990s. So there, people are coming to us asking about improving what they already know about their soils. That's wonderful. Uh, Dr. Tupas and I were on a call with a group looking at the New York City watershed. This watershed, is it urban? Well, it's in a rural area, but it affects an urban area. Eight, 10 million people in New York re, re, uh, have to use the water that's in that watershed. So what the soils are doing, how the soils are interacting with water, making sure that it stays clean is important. That's an urban survey. Maybe not in an urban environment, but it affects an urban area. So important for us to know. And of course, the artisols. For those of you who are not aware, that may end up being the 13th soil order, all about man-affected or human-affected soils. Pretty exciting. All right, it's exciting to me, all right? I expect to see a little excitement from all of you as well. So, all right, woo-woo, all right. So what do we do? Just want to show you very, yeah, kind of few snapshots here. Through our data, mined it, and looked at what counties we are actually doing work in this fiscal year. The dark green counties are counties that we're not working in. We're working in almost every county in the United States, and that's the division. So 400 or so folks. 400 people working in almost every place in the United States. Is that exciting or what? All right, if you don't think it's exciting, so I, I think this is really cool. But let's go a little further. These are the areas we're going to be working with in the next five years. There's not a lot of dark green on that map, is there? We're working almost everywhere. That's 400 folks, plus or minus, that are affecting that much of the country. Can any other organization say that? The answer, I hope, is no, okay? But then think about it. If I threw in all of our cooperators, what county is not affected by what we do as scientists, as soil scientists, ecological scientists? Where is not being affected by what we do? Is there any place? Probably not. So again, something for you to think about. We're also changing how we're going to Look at our projects. And again, for those of you who are not part of SPSD, this is an absolutely meaningless slide. But judging from what uh, Dr. Tupa showed when everybody stood up, the majority of you are part of NRCS, so this can be important. This is going to help us to not only manage what we do, but talk about what we do, communicate what we do, so that it makes sense to people beyond our own group. So to change these projects, have very specific goals so that we can talk about it, so that we can report it, we can let people know what is going on. And of course, there's the dynamic soil survey. Well, I've talked about this many times. I want to keep this at the forefront of your mind, where we're integrating temporal and spatial data for land management. And the key part is to add in that temporal component. How do things change? in a human time scale, something that we really haven't looked at. Also, adding more information, particularly biological, 
How, is, how are we affecting that? What can we learn from the, the biodiversity in the soils to help us better manage land? And there are multiple parts here. It's not just about the soil survey. It's about the ecological survey. It's about the plant survey. It's about climate. It's about making maps, integrating maps, putting them together in one location so that we get information systems and then deliver it to people, not just us, not just the conservation planners, but to anybody who is interested to learn about soils. A easily, easy to navigate system to get the information out to folks so that we can use maps like this. Again, um, Dylan Baudet has helped us put together. Isn't this visual kind of great? to see how the soils, how land management changes, what goes on with runoff, a great demonstration that can help us explain to people what is going on on their land and how their practices could change and help them manage their land better. Maybe, well, let's see. Oh, ah. All right, so this is, this is obviously technical issues. Let's see if I can go back. This is what happens when you ignore Wade and you don't get your slides in ahead of time. So it's all, it's again, it's on me, not on, not on anybody else. Just pick anyone and we'll start wherever. All right, so we get to see him again, yay. <laughs> All right, let's see if this goes, works. And one more, there we go, okay. So, don't expect you to understand this or read this completely. I realize the, the font is small, but the idea behind it is we start with collecting data. We put the data into data sources. This is gonna be critical. We have to conform to the Geospatial Data Act, which means it's not just about having a spreadsheet with numbers. It's about having a spreadsheet with numbers and metadata behind it. Where is it from? What does it mean? How was it collected? So for, let me just quit. All of you out there that are cooperators that are, have uh, uh, proposals or grants with us, raise your hand or being paid by one of those. And you do know that part of your, the requirement when you signed up for that is that you provide the data back to us. Did you know that? Just nod because of course you did, right? Well, all of that data has to be in a form that is, I didn't touch anything this time, all right? So all of that data has to be in a form that is usable by us. So that's part of the Geospatial Data Act and I am simplifying that act greatly. But what that means is that then we can integrate that data into our data system and enhance what we're doing. But there's a group out there that we have tended to ignore, and that's the citizens. How much can we get from citizen science? Has anybody here worked with citizen science? What do you think? Can we use that data? Okay, we got at least two people who are nodding, one person who's maybe ambivalent. So, so but again, it's data. It's something that we should be able to use, and let's hope that we can, we'll find out. Okay. So let's see, we go on one more, and this will all then go into the analytics. The analytics is the sausage grinder. This is what is going to take that information, that, that, that raw data, and then deliver it back out. So that's where we're, we're still struggling with a few parts of this, but this is where we're headed. And it's, it's exciting. I think it's something new, something that hasn't been seen. So think of it as Siri for soils. I like that, we could do that, series for soil. I just thought of that, that's good. All right, so people. <clears throat> Everything I'm talking about cannot be done if we don't have people, all right? This is an absolutely critical part of what we need. Um, we heard, you know, from Carrie, we need people. We need, a, we need a pipeline, right? So we know that. And we know that because we've been trying to hire people. We've been hiring, we've been recruiting, we've been trying to get folks in there. And I, I, this graphic just shows you the hiring gap. We have more jobs open than we have people to fill them. 
We are not the only group in the world that is like that right now. So for those of you that are training the university professors here, do a better job at getting people so that I can hire them. Okay, we want those folks, so we're going to need them. Not just us, though. The entire NRCS is going to need more people. Dr. Tupas talked about, what was it, 18 point something billion dollars to, to, that needs to be spent. You can't spend that without people to actually work to help farmers, producers get that money. So we need more folks. We need more trained folks. But he's working with the universities, trying to convince Daryl Schultz that he needs to do a better job at, at getting more students. Is that going to be enough? Is it enough to just tell universities, get more students? OK, loud. All right, perfect. OK, just to want to make sure you're still awake. OK, so the answer is no, obviously. Working with high schools, middle schools, elementary schools is going to be absolutely critical. You can't start early enough. Okay, yeah, we, we heard about the soil train. That's cool. Think about, think about moving that and something like that in every state, getting kids excited. For those of you that are of my age, what got you interested in science? What was it? Okay, for me, it was the moonshot, landing on the moon, NASA. What did NASA do? They had a budget to tell everybody how great science was, how great NASA was. And that was wonderful. That got people interested. We could do the same for soils. So increase the applicant pool. Outreach to students. If you're not working with these groups, work with them. Tell your story in your own words. We're doing that within the division. Let us know what excites you about soils. That way we can use that information and get it out to people so that we can recruit better. Outreach is a project. As far as I'm concerned, within the division, outreach is a project. All branches, all regions should be doing outreach as part of their annual plan, working with K through 12 to get folks interested in soils. If they come, end up working for the division, wonderful. I love it. If they end up working for somebody else, but working in soils, great too, okay? It's not all about me, well it is, but it's not all about me all the time. We want more soil scientists out there, well-rounded, understanding the environment. We want more ecologists out there, same thing, understand the environment. So we need people in many locations. We need people in a diverse group. These are not only our field people, but our IT people, we've got, to have, we've got to have folks working to help disseminate the information and then, of course, hire people. So all this all round. So spread the word. We have outreach folks now, our natural resources communication specialist, visual communication specialist, an outreach team. If you don't know about these folks, raise your hand for those of you who are here. Heather, Christy. Paul, Jen, raise your hands, stand up, make sure everybody sees you. They're in the back. Talk to them, get involved. Tell your story. Because if we don't tell them what you do, who will? It's up to us to tell everybody what we're doing. Because folks don't know. So if we just love what we do and like to sit in our pit and be quiet, nothing's going to happen. We have to get out there and toot our own horn. So for the future, again, we need partners. So this is something we cannot do ourselves. We need group, you know, the group that's here, universities, private sector. We need all of us working together. You know, a single drop will raise the ocean. Remember that. So we need scientists, all types of scientists, not just within the division, but outside. The society needs more, I'll, I'll go get on my soapbox here, society needs more scientists, people who understand the importance of science. Science is real. And of course, we need field data. Okay? We absolutely need to get more field data. That's how we can deliver better information. 
So as I said, I can fill any amount of time necessary. I think I did that with two minutes to spare before break. So if there are questions, I will be around. Um, feel free to ask. And a lot of what I talked about, there will be folks here that will be expanding on it. Let's listen. So thank you all. All right, that takes us to a break here. We're going to reconvene at 10 o'clock. So um, find yourself some coffee and snacks, and, and, and we'll go from there. Ruth Plenty Sweetgrass, she kills. If you're here, please come talk to me.
graduate. Bismarck State College, education done right.
let's start to move towards your seats, please. Let's start to move towards your seats so we can keep things on time. Thank you. Let's move towards our seats, please. Let's start to settle down so we get started on, on time, please. So in case you didn't hear it earlier, those of you that have your poster in hand and are looking for what to do with it, bring them to room 432, please. And then we'll get them to the Gateway to Science and get them hung for you tomorrow for the poster social. All right, here we are. So I'm gonna call some attention to some of the exhibits that we have around the, have around the room. I'm, you have to forgive me, I'm still dealing with how to, how to navigate my, my crutches and being able to see what I'm reading and look out at the crowd without falling over. Um, but if you look around the room, we've got a, a, a catena of, uh, of uh, North Dakota soils, including Williams, our state soil, over in the corner there, the Zoll, Williams, Bobells, and Tonka. There's a, a, an art exhibit um, from some documentation um, taken in circa 1960 in the area that we were at yesterday in the field at, the, at those pits. Very e extravagant field notes, so take some time to appreciate the art and the science. Um, as we move around over here, um, we got some mini soil profiles that we built some soil frames for. Uh, found those in, in a basement in our state office. And they were used for training for some of our folks. There's a, a set of monoliths that we prepared, that our crew prepared uh, for the, the Lewis and Clark Bicentennial. Uh, so a group of monoliths that are associated with that. And then there's the recruitment table. And then um, be sure to, to engage with Drew and his crew at the Hugh Hammett Bennett Center. And then they've got that to direct you down the hall for more in-depth conversations and technical conversations. So without further ado, we'll move on with our agenda. Next we have with us, um, hold on so I can get the crutches on. Um, Dr. Andy Clark. He's with the State Historical Society of North Dakota, and he is the Director of Archaeology and Historic Preservation and the, and the Deputy Shippo for um, the State Historic, Historical Society of North Dakota. So, Andy, join us. I have to uh, respectfully disagree with uh, Dr. Tupa about the uh, height of the podium. Uh, the, uh, I do, uh, 
Although maybe commiserate the, uh, about the uh, one size fits all approach that most podiums have. Um, and then also to uh, answer Dr. Limbo's question about when did corn first uh, start growing in North Dakota, uh, uh, especially horticulturally, at least a thousand years. Uh, so it's uh, been that long, but, but to his point, climate change has taken a toll uh, and, uh, and something that we're all concerned about and, uh, and uh, hoping that uh, you know, archaeologists and soil scientists can uh, work together to understand the full history of, the, uh, uh, of, of climate change. Um, the, uh, Want to first want to thank uh, Wade Bott and Lance uh, and NCSS for inviting me. Uh, I feel a little bit of a, like a fish out of water at a conference with a bunch of soil scientists and being what I'm guessing is the only archaeologist in the room, probably, maybe. Um, the, uh, like Wade said, I'm a, a director of archaeology and historic preservation uh, for the State Historical Society uh, and Deputy Shippo. Um, while you're here, I invite you to come uh, visit our, uh, the State Museum, which is over on uh, just a few blocks east, uh, uh, right next to the State Capitol. The, uh, the Heritage Center is a, uh, a beautiful place to work and uh, have some great exhibits uh, uh, throughout time from uh, paleontological times to, uh, to modern times. Uh, so I invite you to see that. And we also have a, uh, a host of uh, state historic sites that are within the, uh, the, the uh, Bismarck area that I'll point out a little bit. And, and if you do have time, uh, I know you have a busy schedule to come and visit those as well. Um, one of the things that uh, it was uh, in, like, interesting to hear and excited to hear uh, is that some of, the, uh, some of the problems that you all have been dealing with uh, uh, and, and issues that, we're looking at, uh, that you've been looking at are, are resonate uh, with us. Uh, the uh, partnerships, uh, trying to uh, fill that hiring gap, um, uh, more inclusivity in in, in archaeological research are all things that uh, all things that we're, uh, uh, we've been dealing with dealing with as well. Um, but just to begin, I wanted to uh, talk a little bit about what uh, archaeology is. Uh, archaeology is understanding the human past using interdisciplinary approaches and often through material culture. It is good at quantifying data and providing precise chronological information to understand technological changes. However, it is not a replacement for traditional knowledge. Uh, archaeologists don't define what it is to be part of a culture or a group, uh, the community does. So the, uh, what, uh, when uh, it's at its best, uh, it's, it works through partnerships, uh, through diverse uh, multidisciplinary groups, soil scientists, uh, geologists, geographers, uh, chemists, uh, and most importantly, descendant communities. Um, through, this, uh, through my presentation, what I hope to show is a uh, couple of these efforts uh, uh, in understanding uh, trade uh, and how trade exceeded, uh, was an important aspect of, uh, of uh, life in North Dakota going back thousands of years. Uh, two places that, the, uh, that we're going to be looking at is the, uh, uh, the first mineral uh, exports of North Dakota and then the early agriculture uh, through a couple of the sites uh, around North Dakota, uh, specifically uh, uh, Yellow Earth, uh, Mandan Village, what is now known as a double ditch, uh, shown here on the uh, slide here. Um, in giving this presentation, I do so with a little bit of a heavy heart. Uh, the uh, information provided has been through a lot of the work of Fern Swenson, who is my predecessor as the Director of uh, Archaeology and Historic Preservation. Uh, she passed away last year to, uh, to, uh, to uh, lost her battle to cancer. Uh, and so I hope that uh, what I present here does her justice uh, and in looking at the research that, that, uh, that she initiated and, uh, and is really the, the bulk of this presentation. Uh, but it would also be uh, uh, important to talk about the, uh, the, the groups that she brought together to, to, do the, uh, to, to understand the, uh, the area here. Uh, with multiple universities working with Prominent archaeologists such as Stan Ayler, uh, Ken Kavami, uh, nonprofit organizations such as Paleocultural Research Group, uh, countless undergraduate, graduate students who now occupy academic positions throughout the country, uh, and most importantly, uh, working directly with uh, uh, descendant community researchers uh, such as Elgin Crowsbreast and Calvin Grinnell from the Manda and Hadassah Rickera Nation. Uh, See if I can figure this out. The uh, before I get started, though, I wanted to make a quick note uh, on how we understand the uh, the, the pre-contact history of North America. 
to, uh, to uh, Native American communities, uh, this statement is going to be a complete, uh, complete under, under, understatement. But the uh, American history has notoriously underrepresented the complexity and longevity of pre-contact North America. Uh, at the Historical Society, we're preparing for uh, America 250, the 250th uh, uh, anniversary of, uh, uh, of, of the United States. And a lot has happened in, the, in, the, in those years. Uh, we're, there's a lot, of, a lot to be proud about. In a quarter of a millennia, we've seen uh, geographies change through wars. We've seen uh, the, the Bolshevik, uh, the Russian Revolution. We've seen the, uh, the decline of the European um, or uh, English, uh, uh, English kings and queens. Uh, and so there's, there's a lot of things, a lot of countries that haven't made it through what we've made it through. But that pales in comparison to the at least 15 millennia of history uh, that, that pres, uh, predated uh, the uh, contact here. Uh, and, I, and I point out uh, Cahokia here, which is uh, as, as an example of this. Uh, it's the largest known urban center uh, in pre-contact North America, uh, located near uh, uh, East St. Louis on the American bottom. Uh, at its height, uh, at around 80, 1100 uh, 1200, uh, to 1200, Cahokia had an estimated population of about 20,000 people. Uh, this is as large as most European cities at the time, and larger than London. Uh, the scale of the construction there uh, uh, is, is equally as impressive. Uh, the center of the... Uh, the, center, the, the large mound in the center there is Monk's Mound, has a larger footprint than the pyramids in Giza. Um, the uh, exact size of the metropolitan area of Cahokia is unknown because of the uh, uh, because of uh, urban development in the St. Louis area, but it was a large urban center, complete with suburbs, uh, uh, multi-ethnic population, centralized hub of activity, and it was a true international city in every sense of the word. Uh, mound building groups lived in the American Bottoms long after uh, long after Cahokia lost its influence. And so it wasn't that the people disappeared or the Cahokia collapsed, it was the, the, the government moved on. Uh, there is also, uh, I mentioned it here, because there's uh, extensive trade links uh, between Cahokia and the early Mandan and Hadassah villages along the Missouri River at the same time. The, uh, as I mentioned, uh, the trade is gonna be a, a, a large focus of what I wanted to talk about today. Um, and uh, Knife River Flint, uh, we like to joke about, is being North Dakota's first mineral export. Uh, only sec second to obsidian is the preferred lithic material uh, for flint napping nationwide. Knife River, uh, uh, Knife, Knife River Flint provides a uh, durable, uh, sharp edge that's not quite as sharp as the, uh, the surgical edge that uh, obsidian provides, uh, but it, uh, but it did, did provide a more durable, longer lasting uh, important resource for uh, early stone tool makers. Uh, the sil silicified uh, lignite, uh, 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 from origin, as, as a silicified lignite, its origins are from peat, uh, and it holds its, uh, uh, did not uh, develop naturally in North Dakota. It was actually a glacial outwash uh, that was pushed down here and is only found uh, in, uh, in Dunn and Mercer counties in, uh, in North Dakota, while obsidian is found at uh, many volcanic locations across the western United States. Uh, hundreds of thousands of quarry pits among many dozens of quarry sites uh, in, uh, of western North Dakota show the, uh, the enormous scale of the, uh, and the intensity of quarrying in the area. Uh, the, uh, the first quarry pits dated to when the first people started uh, living in the area, uh, and this is at least 10 to 15,000 years old. Uh, and it's con used continuously until the contact period when metal trade goods took over. Uh, they quarried large nodules, you can see in the lower left, uh, and they would remove those to uh, smaller workshop areas where they would then uh, uh, modify those down to be more transportable and, and used, as a, used to uh, trade uh, uh, both locally and interregionally. Um, the best known quarry uh, is up in the upper left hand quarry is the, uh, the Lynch Quarry, which is listed as a National Historic Landmark in 2011. Uh, the 690 acre site had on average uh, 25 to 30 quarry pits per acre uh, with an estimate uh, of about 17,000 over the entire site. Uh, this is one of dozens of quarry pits like this across the, uh, the, the uh, uh, Dunn and Mercer County areas. Um, uh, it's also a great example of a, uh, of a public-private partnership 
as a site is uh, on uh, private landowner, as, as a site is on, uh, okay, on private land, continually protected by the landowners, uh, Allen and Gail Lynch. Uh, the primary source area uh, is a small area in, uh, that's in the darker brown uh, uh, in, in western North Dakota. The, 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 light, the orange area, the darker orange area, is the area where uh, Knife River Flint was primarily used as the, uh, as the, uh, as the resource. And the larger area, uh, the larger orange area, is uh, is um, the the extent of the distribution. And I think that this is actually uh, an outdated map, as we're finding that that some of the uh, knife river flint is being found in the southeastern United States and uh, and and farther afield. So it stretches from the uh, like uh, southwestern Canada, southwestern United States, southeastern United States, and into the Great Lakes regions. Uh, secondly, uh, when archaeologists talk about Plains Village cultures along the Missouri River uh, in North and South Dakota, we're primarily referring to the semi-sedentary ancestors of the Mandan, Hidatsa, and Arikara, who lived in earth lodge communities subsisting on farming, hunting, and gathering. The earliest villages uh, along the Missouri River date to about uh, 81,000 and are located, uh, were located in the, uh, uh, the Big Bend region between the uh, Bad River and, and White Rivers in South Dakota. Uh, due to droughts in Nebraska and Kansas, ancestral Rikara populations moved to the region starting about AD 1300. Uh, as as mo villagers moved forward into traditional territories de developed uh, with the Rikaras to the south, uh, Mandan Century located between North and South Dakota border in the Square Buttes just north of Bismarck, uh, and the Hidatsa settling upstream. Uh, farming corn, beans, and squash provided much nutrition, uh, but to round out their diets, villagers would also rely on gathering juneberries, choke cherries, plums, rosehip, prairie turnip, and other wild plants. Uh, proteins came from hunting, fishing, bone, elk, antelope, and small games, bird, and fish. Uh, the largest of the villages was a Mandan village named Yellow Earth, now known as Double Ditch State Historic Site. Uh, the modern name stems from the two concentric fortification ditches visible on the surface that encircled the village. Uh, during the time of the occupations, villagers built a wall on the inside of the periphery of the ditch, uh, protecting from intruders and delineating the size of the settlement. Uh, regional Mandan population at the time reached around an, an estimated 10,000, and at its peak, uh, Double Ditch uh, uh, had about 2,000 people, uh, with 160 homes, um, which, makes it 95, or which makes it larger than 95% of North Dakota towns today. The, uh, the Mandan were known as the premier traders in the Northern Plains, and Double Ditch was its largest trade center. Uh, perhaps the largest economic driver for the Mandan was corn. Uh, along with the sister staples bean squash, corn was grown in the floodplains uh, adjacent to the village and the crops were established, tended, and harvested by women. Uh, despite of the lack of modern irrigation techniques, floodplain gardening was highly successful. The fertile floodplain soils uh, were replenished by yearly floods, however, drought and the semi-arid climate was still a concern. Uh, during the harvest, uh, women would carry the corn basket by basket up the steep terrace slopes uh, into the village. Uh, once processed and dried on the drying rack, shown in the picture there, uh, uh, the, uh, the uh, the yields were stored underground in what archaeologists call bell-shaped cash pits, uh, uh, as you see on the lower right. Uh, since they were underground, they worked. Uh, the, the underground uh, temperatures worked to keep the surplus cool, uh, and you kind of think of these as large walk-in coolers. Uh, each storage pit averaged about six feet deep and could hold 34 bushels. Uh, a single Mandan village could store 70,000 bushels uh, at any one time, in indicating a well-developed industry that provided year-round or year-to-year -year subsistence. At the time of Double Ditch, uh, Hidatsa communities occupied the Knife River uh, quarry region with corn, uh, Knife River flint, and other resources such as bison products to trade, uh, both to their uh, less nomadic uh, or more, more nomadic and less sedentary uh, neighbors, and also long distance down into modern day St. Louis, long distance trade goods came into the Northern Plains. Uh, important stone, re stone resources such as obsidian from the west, Catlinite or pipestone from the uh, southern, uh, from southeastern Minnesota, native copper from the Great Lakes region, uh, and ocean resources such as shell from the Atlantic coast and Gulf coast were made into which were made into decorative and sacred items such as pendants and gorges. Not only were the double ditch uh, population aware of the larger world, there were major economic players. 
In the past 20 years, archaeologists learned much about the timeline of double dish through non-destructive methods such as topographical mapping, ground-based geophysics such as magnetic radiometry, gradiometry, ground penetrating radar, and electrical resistivity and airborne thermal mapping with limited archaeological testing. Prior to the geophysical surveys, archaeologists believed that uh, the vast majority of the cache pits contained were, uh, were in the uh, earth lodges, but magnetic data shows that the large number were also located outside the lodge in the public space. Um, we now know that uh, double ditch is a bit of a misnomer too. Uh, there, through the surveys, uh, they're able to identify two more uh, concentric ditches that were not visible on the surface, only visible uh, in, the, uh, in the geophysical data. Uh, the, uh, and the limited excavation show that the most recent ditch, or the, most, uh, the, the outer ditch was the oldest ditch, uh, dating to AD 1490. Uh, the inner ditch uh, dates to AD 1750 and circles about 32 lodges with an estimated population of about 400. Uh, between 1782 and 1785, uh, double ditches abandoned and the Mandan moved into the Knife River uh, region along with their Hidatsa neighbors. Uh, there's a couple things to note through that we find through this. Is first, the scale of ditch building is enormous. The, uh, the amount of work that effort went into it can be measured into kilometers rather than meters and it emphasizes the, uh, the significant public works accomplished through only high levels of leadership and, uh, and planned engineering. Second is the, uh, the contraction of the site, which is uh, associated with the depopulation, the, the terrible effects of uh, European diseases that were first brought in by trade goods, and then, uh, and then through direct contact with, uh, uh, with the Europeans. So to summarize, uh, the, uh, I kind of wanted to talk about what it means to be North Dakotan. Uh, the, uh, to be a North Dakotan, I kind of think of ourselves as self-sufficient, uh, economies based on mineral extraction, farming, and hunting, an integral part of the modern world with resources that North Dakotans have always been, that have always provided, even if the modern world thinks we may be some rubbish uh, people sometimes, but, the, uh, but without, uh, without the resources we provide and the culture that, uh, that, uh, that we develop and, and, uh, and extend on, uh, the modern world is much better. So thank you. Thank you, Andy. That was fantastic. All right. Next on our agenda, we have Dr. Ruth Plenty Sweetgrass. She kills. And, uh, um, Ruth is uh, um, comes to us from Nuinta Hidatsa Hanish College at Newtown, and uh, she is a member of the three affiliated tribes at Fort, Berth uh, Fort Berthold, and also. Um, Descended from Fort Peck Sioux and Sinboy. So, welcome. Did you want to? Good morning. I'm happy to be here today, and what you've heard is my ancestral homelands, and I welcome you to North Dakota. I heard this is like the largest group in a, quite a while uh, for the meeting. I really appreciate having um, the presentation previous because it gives you some of the context of what I'll be sharing with you today. I work at my tribal college as the food sovereignty director and a lot of the work I do is with our gardens. So as was previously mentioned, the Mandan, Hiradza, and Arikara people lived along the rivers in earth lodge villages. Some of the things that I think are important to also think about is um, we're still here and we still garden and we still have a lot of those same relationships with the land that we're currently located on as well as our historical territories. As a Hiradza Mandan woman, um, gardening is something that is very important to me as well as thinking about the roles traditionally of women. One of the things that wasn't mentioned about our villages and about our food systems was the women were the ones who built our earth lodges. And the women were the ones, as was mentioned, who took care of the gardens. And so that meant that the woman was the owner of the house and she was the one who 
had the, the rules of the house as well as with the gardens. So the woman put the energy into building the gardens, maintaining the gardens, and then when there was all of the surplus, she also had that control over the trade. So at that time, the women had a very important role in our communities. The women also, among the Heradza people, are the ones that our clanship goes through. So it wasn't just our food systems, but also our kinship systems. I also want to just back up a little bit. Um, oh, shoot, I didn't see those soils. So I came in today and I saw the, and I don't know the correct language for the, the soil exhibits, but um, if you get to go down to Mandan, the Agricultural Research Station, there is Mandan, Hiradza, and Arikara soils. So I, was, I rushed over there to see if those were our soils, and I don't, I, my grandfather was a um, soil conservationist, so I'm, I'm learning to appreciate soils, but it was just really cool to see my people's names represented in some of the names of the soils of our region. So in our traditional gardens, and today I'm mostly referencing the Hiradza and Mandan. My brother was um, unable to be with us and speak specifically about the Rikara gardening. But the women would plant the gardens and then the young girls, so around the ages of like 10 to 12 years old, would be the ones who would watch over the gardens. And you saw the example of the corn stages. So the young girls would sit on the corn stages and they would watch the corn for possibly if enemies were coming, possibly for keeping birds away, for shooing horses out of the gardens, and also to keep an eye that there weren't any naughty little boys coming in to steal produce. One of the things they would do is they would visit back and forth with each other, but they also would sing garden songs. And um, our relationship with the land, with the plants, with our food was something that had developed over so many thousands of years. And our people believed and still believe that our corn has a spirit and we think of our corn like a child, like a baby. And you think of how you care for your children. And so they would sing these songs to the corn. So I'll, I'll share one of our corn songs with you. And you can imagine, you know, you see these young girls sitting on this corn stage. And you see the corn, if you're familiar with corn, kind of shifting in the wind. And so this song translates to, the corn is my pleasure. So that's, that's one of our corn songs, and it, it's just really like surreal to, to look out and see all of you, but also to see our river and think about, you know, just envisioning a garden not too far from where we are right now. So in addition to um, our young 
girls caring for our corn and caring for our squash, our beans, our melons. They also um, had to be aware and, and watching what was going on around them and around the gardens. And they also, the women had to be aware of the timing of when to plant. And so one of the observations that they made was when the geese would leave, because the geese would be the ones that would take the, the spirits of our, our seeds with them. And so then, when the geese would come back, that was, they were bringing the spirits of our seeds back with them. So we knew that that was time to start preparing our gardens. And the first thing that we would plant is our sunflowers. So today, we still watch for when the geese return, and it uh, has been described to me as just such a joyous, you know, that's the return. And we know that that's um, the perpetuation and rejuvenation of life. So we plant our sunflowers on the perimeter of our garden, and then approximately two weeks after that, then we continue planting with our corn, beans, squash. I'm less familiar with planting our watermelon. The watermelon variety that we have is an aricara variety. So this is my first year growing the aricara um, watermelon. One of the things that, there were a lot of disruptions to our gardening practices and to our traditional food systems. So part of that is disease. So smallpox really had a huge impact on the perpetuation of our traditional knowledge systems because there were such huge losses in our population in such a short amount of time. So you think about the knowledge about when to grow, how to grow, where the seeds are located, which <clears throat> even the selection of, for example, we have almost 20 varieties of corn. So which corn variety are you going to grow which season? Because you can kind of estimate, is it going to be a wet season? Well, if it's going to be a wet season, I'm going to plant my blue corn. But if it's going to be dry, I'm going to plant this other corn. So that just a lot of that knowledge got wiped out very quickly. You think about not only just the growing of those seeds, but the preservation of those seeds, the how you prepare those foods. So preparing those foods, you think about also the technologies our corn mortars and pestles use to mill or grind up our corn. You think about our um, traditional tools in the garden, our um, antler rakes, our buffalo bone scapulas, you think about our pottery, you know, how are we going to um, cook if, if we don't have that pottery, if we don't have our traditional baskets, you saw an image of our burden baskets. So a lot of that knowledge was lost. And one of the other things that I think is important to realize is within our knowledge systems, among the Mandan and Hiradza people, not all knowledge is meant for everyone, and there's specialized knowledge that you have to acquire through certain protocols. So that's an, uh, two examples are pottery as well as basketry. You have to have the right to be able to do pottery, to do basketry. And so one of the things, um, that, like I said, was disease, but also the impact of boarding schools, removing our children from the homes and from the communities, removing them from the land, the Allotment Act, or privatizing our land instead of having communal, communal property, the Relocation Act, so in the 40s, moving tribal members to large urban areas, a lot of times in other states. And then you see also the, the bringing in of research, as well as the change of our food systems because of rations, and um, 
Then we have those societal changes, the changes in our food systems, which resulted in things like diabetes. So we ended up having a, a high incidence of diabetes. Our foods changed from having the corn, beans, squash, melons, turnips, wild onions, June berries, choke cherries, wild plums, bullberries, to having to figure out how to cook with lard and with white wheat flour and hopefully some kinds of meat um, rather than the wild game. Another impact that the Mandan and Hiradza people saw was um, the construction of the Garrison Dam. And so as my grandmother's oldest granddaughter, I spent a lot of time with her, and she would talk about this place called Alba Woods, where she grew up. And at that time, we didn't have the large community gardens that was mentioned you know, historically, but almost every family at that time had their own garden. And so to a large extent, the communities were self-sufficient. Then with the construction of the Garrison Dam, the majority of the population of our reservation was flooded and had to be relocated up onto the higher ground. And so this community of Alba Woods that my grandmother would talk to me about and I would hear all of these stories was one of those communities that was flooded and had to be relocated onto higher ground. And unfortunately, because we were no longer along the river floodplain, gardening was much more of a challenge. And one of the observations that uh, a gardener has shared with me, a traditional gardener, was the impact on our squash. So in the image of our cash pits, you saw where it, it, there was layers of sliced squash in the cash pit. Well, if you see some of our squash now, it's really hard. It, the shell is really hard. And so you think about having to cut that squash using a buffalo scapula knife. I can barely cut that with a metal knife now. It's, it's hard to cut that. And so what, what it was my grandfather that was talking about this. Um, he attributes that change in the shell of our squash to having to grow our squash in a much different um, I guess I would say climate, but maybe that's not the right, um, a, a much different environment with, with different soil and uh, impacts versus along the floodplains. <clears throat> so one of the things that I like to encourage people is to think about the removal of dams and the potential impact of what that could mean for the Mandan, Hidatsa, and Arikara people, but also for our larger environments and for our food systems. One of my dreams is that within my lifetime, we will see the removal of the Garrison Dam and maybe someday my feet will also be on the soil of the Alba Woods community where my grandmother grew up. We'll see, because <clears throat> you all have uh, a lot of places where you have impact. And so if that's something you're interested in, I'm interested in it too, and I would love to connect with you after this. So I want to bring that also back around to thinking about the social justice and our gardening and our knowledge systems. As was mentioned in the introduction, I work for the Mandan, Hiradza, and Arikara Nations tribally chartered, tribally chartered tribal college and university, the Nuetta Hiradza Sanish College. So in the 1950s, the tribal colleges were a dream that different tribal nations across the United States had because 
institutions of higher education at that time were not serving tribal people in the ways that they needed. At that point, we had already been historically excluded from education. And so tribal colleges were the, the dream that came to fruition in the 1950s. This year, Nuetta Hiradza Sanish College is celebrating our 50th anniversary. And our main purpose is to provide both the education and services to the Mandan, Hiradza, and Arikara people. We have degrees, um, both associates and bachelor's degrees in a number of different um, emphases. And in 1994, we, along with the other tribal colleges, were given land grant status. So we had the opportunity to think about what kind of research would be relevant to us. And I mentioned some of the changes to our food systems and the impacts of those changes. And one of those that was really prominent in the early 90s was the incidence of diabetes. So the college decided to look at finding land to be able to do gardening projects and to do research. So in 1997, we entered into an agreement with the Army Corps of Engineers who built the dam and flooded the reservation and so now they have the jurisdiction over all of the land along the reservoir <clears throat> to lease approximately 30 acres of land along the river. And at that time, we called this place the Land Lab. We've now changed the name to the Four Sisters Gardens. In that space, we developed a traditional garden. We also added community gardens. We planted things like June berries. We made sure that we maintained the existing choke cherries. And we did research. We continue to do research there. We have regenerative agriculture plots. And we also recently added an orchard. So trying to revitalize the practices of gardening. In addition to the hands-on practices of gardening, we are also, as an institution, working actively in seed rematriation. So I had mentioned that some of the impacts our communities had seen included research, and so a lot of knowledge and resources were extracted from our communities and from our people. And one of those things was our seeds. So we are working with a number of institutions, museums, agencies, as well as private individuals to bring those seed relatives back into our communities. We have, I mentioned, about 20 different varieties of corn we have, I want to say, around seven varieties of beans. I'm not as sure about how many actual varieties of squash. I would say we have probably 20 different varieties of squash. One melon that I know of, we also grow tobacco. So we're working on bringing those seed relatives back home. Part of bringing them home and bringing them back into our communities is to revitalize them. You know, they, some of those seeds have been set aside for decades and haven't been grown out. And so we need to think about seed health. One of our projects, we have a collaboration. I mentioned the Agriculture Research Service down in Mandan. Our project with them is a um, collaborative agreement, or cooperative agreement on seed multiplication. So North Dakota, we, we don't have a whole lot of trees. Like you're seeing a lot of trees right here, but a lot of the state doesn't have a whole lot of trees. And, and I don't know if it's still true, but we're the, at one time, we're the least naturally, least naturally forested state in the United States. I think we probably still are. So we get a lot of wind. 
And if you know about growing corn, corn really can hybridize very easily and quickly. So you think about 20 varieties of corn out in this windy area, the recommendation is to grow varieties of corn in North Dakota at least one mile apart from other varieties of corn. So you um, reduce the risk of hybridization. You think about Fort Berthold and the access to land to either garden or farm, it's, it's really a challenge then to grow out 20 varieties of corn a year to then multiply out those seeds unless you have the people power to do hand pollination. And so our institution is limited by land as well as people power. But through this cooperative agreement, we're working to grow out multiple varieties of corn each year, which will then be added into our seed cash at the college. I believe each year we do um, our growing season down in Mandan, we have six varieties of corn that we're growing out because that's the, the capacity with their land as well as their people to hand pollinate. So to me, that's like, that's so exciting. And I don't know if you've had the opportunity to see our corn. It's so beautiful. There's so many different varieties, so many different colors. And it's exciting to think about, um, I'm still learning a lot about our different corns, the flower corn, flint corn, dent corn. Um, I can't even, I, I, I'm learning. But we've become so um, accustomed to just the sweet corn that now we have to re-acclimate our palates to these other varieties of corn. And we have to learn how to cook and prepare these other varieties of corn. So that's, it's, it's sort of new and exciting to think about um, these reawakening these relationships that our people have with our seeds. The work that we're doing is trying to help our people to regain those relationships they have with the land, to help them to regain those relationships with our plant relatives, to revitalize our food systems, to revitalize those pieces of our culture that have been sleeping or dormant, to revitalize our songs that go with our gardens, those traditional practices, to bring back those traditional technologies. So, for example, we've had basketry classes. We're going to be having a pottery class. We, last year, collaborated with a sister tribe. To the best of my knowledge, we don't have, or we didn't, have any tribal members who still knew how to make the corn mortars and pestles. And so we collaborated with a sister tribe to bring that knowledge back into our communities. So thinking about how to bring that knowledge back in um, through partnerships. We're also seeing, I mentioned, um, challenges because of climate change. So having access to land, but also water. And I don't know, I guess maybe I'm a big dreamer. <laughs> I'm an optimist. Um, and I see, I've heard the stories from my grandparents, from my grandmother. I know some of the history with our loss, our loss of land, our loss of knowledge, but I'm also part of the revitalization. In one of our communities in the south segment on our reservation, they have traditional gardens, they have orchards, they're bringing in honeybees. In the White Shield community, they have large community gardens, traditional gardens, Juneberry orchards. In our Mandaree community, we have 
elders' gardens. And then if you make it up our way, um, we have by the partial community, a very large tribal greenhouse that's being constructed. So it's still in the first phase, but there will be five phases in that um, development of that greenhouse. And I just wanna be cognizant of time. I was told to leave time for questions or not. Yes, okay. So just, um, in closing, I want to thank my ancestors and my relatives for the knowledge that has been passed down and shared with me that I can share with you today. But I also want to acknowledge those people who aren't represented here in this room right now. Um, I was sad to hear about Fern. I, I did have the opportunity to work a little bit with Fern. And that's one of the things, you know, my grandmother's no longer with us and I'm sure we all have relatives and colleagues who um, could have been in this room but aren't with us uh, on this plane anymore. And as a mom, I know that when we come to spaces like this, sometimes our children aren't with us and so there's people taking care of our children or our puppies or our homes. And so just wanting to acknowledge there's reasons why there aren't people here and um, hoping for all of you that when you do return to your homes that you found them well, that everything is well and good when you return. So thank you for the opportunity to share a little bit about the history as well as some of the contemporary um, status of the Mandan, Hiradza, and Arikara people's gardens. And I'm going to open it for questions, if there are any questions, because I know there's a big schedule you got going. All right, are there any questions for Ruth? Thank you. Raise your hand, we'll get you a mic. Steven. Hi, good afternoon. Um, I was kind of curious about um, when you talked earlier about the male-female roles earlier in the communities, and if you could talk any more about that and if any of that is still the case today or how that has evolved over time. Yes. Um, I think there's, there's definitely... Um, things that are still gendered, but I also think that because of um, some of the changes that we've seen, there is starting to be some overlap. So for example, uh, quill work is one of those things that was gendered. So it was the women that were, would do the quill work, but now we see where men are starting to do the quill work. We, oh, if you get up to my reservation, the earth lodges, we do have more and more earth lodges in our communities that are being constructed, but the majority of the work is being done by men, not the women. And so, so it is changing, although I think most people are aware of what were traditionally the gendered roles. Um, and I don't know, I, I wonder if at some point that is something we'll try to shift back to because you know, there's reasons why we had the separation of roles and responsibilities based on gender. I don't know. So, yes, that does still exist, but it's kind of changed a little. Yeah, I have a, another curiosity, and is uh, if uh, what's the relationship of uh, their gardening and the uh, different people doing what you you know what you're doing, and with the Swan Water Conservation Districts uh, in the area, and also NRCS. I don't know. Um, so we have some relationships with some agencies. And I, um, I've been home, I've been in my current capacity for about two years now. We do a lot of work probably most with USDA 
and with extension. Um, but uh, that doesn't mean we don't welcome more collaboration. Yes, yes. And that's part of what I think is exciting about um, these mixed spaces because you don't know who you don't know and you know where are those opportunities for collaboration. Thank you. Um, I have, haven't seen, oh, this is really loud. I haven't seen the different varieties of corn, but is there a place where we can see like them growing, the, the different colors? So um, you can see six varieties down in Mandan at the Agricultural Research Service there. We, at our, um, on our gardens, we only grow out one traditional variety a year just because trying to not um, to avoid hybridization and then individual uh, gardeners will have different varieties in their corn of corn that they're growing but that's going to be you know pretty spread out but I would totally welcome you to come up to our gardens and then too if you're interested you know I believe you can request tours from Claire Fredrickson down at the Agricultural Research Service. Oh, hello, Ruth. Yes. Um, just a quick question about yes. language and sort of the population of the population of the peoples. Where do you where do you feel in terms of hopefully optimism about uh, language language continuity in terms of traditional uh, languages? Uh, of course. Exactly okay. Exactly what I mean. <clears throat> okay. So pre-COVID, um, we had one. It was estimated one fluent Nueta or Mandan speaker, and he's no longer with us. But we do have a lot of language that was recorded for Nueta, and we do have a tribal program to revitalize those languages, so we have a master and apprentices. <clears throat> so they do have varying levels of fluency with the Mandan language. Pre-COVID, it was estimated approximately 30 um, Arikara or Sahnish speakers. And then pre-COVID, um, approximately 100 Hiradza language speakers. And uh, as you can imagine, we had a significant number of tribal elders who passed away because of COVID. And so we haven't done a, a survey to um, update those estimates. But um, there are the, the tribal language program as well as every semester our institution offers level one Mandan, level one Hiradza and a level one Arikara and the public school, or the schools on the reservation, the K-12 schools, also offer language in the class, classrooms. Any other questions? This is kind of related to the first question, the male-female roles. Yes. So with the earth building and all of the uh, technology that was developed, did the women do that too? I would assume so, like with the design of the homes and all of that, or were they like, here are your blueprints and um, go to it, or I would imagine or assume that, that the women were very much involved in the, all the STEM that's associated with technology and building yes. and things yes. like that. Women, women were and are scientists <laughs> and right, engineers. Right, right. And <laughs> yeah, that's, that's the undertone. Of that. Yeah, yes. And um, so part of that, that transfer of knowledge was the apprenticeship. But also, I guess, thinking about our knowledge system, some of that was through observation and learning and trial and error. But another piece of our knowledge systems that was important to knowledge creation or new knowledge was also dreams. So that was something that, um, and still, 
you know, factors into our knowledge systems and the creation of new knowledge and, and the things that we do. So I, I just wanted to mention that it's not all uh, knowledge that we as individuals create or collectively as humans create, but also the, the knowledge, um, I don't know, from the ethos, is that the right? But yeah, thank you. All right, we have time for one more, maybe. Anybody else? Kristen. Hello. Um, so my question is maybe a little complicated, and I don't know if uh, you can answer it, but um, I'm just wondering if, well, now that you're established, there's sort of a, a pipeline, if you will, to get young people interested and excited about learning more about their culture and everything, but um, is that still a challenge that you guys are facing, is like trying to get the young people interested and excited about learning more about the traditional way of life or the way that, you know, your people have done things, or is there maybe a little bit more resistance because, you know, they're growing up in this hybrid world of, you know, they're, they're, you know, belong to these people, but they're also living in this, this other culture that's happening. So I'm just wondering if there's a little bit of resistance or if young people are really receptive to learning the traditional ways of life. Sure. Well, that was one, I, I appreciate your phrasing of your question because that was one thing I didn't, um, elaborate on much was also the impact of oil development on my communities and pipelines. Um, so that might not be the, the phrasing I would use when I think about trying to draw young people into uh, our culture. So that's another impact on access to land and other resources. Um, I, my observation is, um, and partially related to the oil development is there's much more diversity on my reservation as far as the kinds of people who live on my reservation. So when I was growing up, it was predominantly the, the three tribes and maybe some other tribal people and um, non-tribal people or, or white people on the reservation. But now we have a lot more ethnic diversity on our reservation and so I think that's um, kind of an added challenge to really providing a strong foundation culturally because they're exposed to so much compared to what they were exposed to when I was a young person. But I believe that there is an excitement and I would say in probably the age range of like 14 to 25 of culture and language and especially food revitalization. So they're hungry for it and that's exciting to see. And thinking about, you know, how do we get the, the younger ones excited about that because then we're, we're growing that as we go. So I feel, and maybe I'm just optimistic, but I feel like we're, in a good space and time right now, that we have people who are curious, we have collaborations with different institutions and agencies, and you know, it's just a, a real ripe time right now for, for this work. But I see I'm at 11 o'clock, and I thank you again for the opportunity to share, and if anybody wants to talk about dam removal or <laughs> gardens, Come find me. Thank you. Absolutely awesome. And Ruth, that is a paired set of monoliths over there, the Arikara, Mandan, Hidatsa, and Sakakawea profiles. They reside at my office. All right, next on our agenda, we have Dr. Mark Liebig.
from ARS here in Mandan, Northern Great Plains Research Lab. Welcome, Mark. Thanks. Oh, thanks, Wade. Hey, before I get going, Ruth, thanks so much for sharing. I, I just want to, just a little story. I, have an attribute of sharing our research with people who, anyone who will listen. And, and our portfolio is pretty broad at the station, but when I talk about the, uh, the native garden space and the seed matriation effort that we're doing at the lab that Claire is leading, that's what they get most excited about. And so it's a, I think it's a bright future for that, and I'm uh, we're glad to be a part of that. So, um, yeah, thank you, Wade, again. Uh, it's great to be here. Um, I was visiting with John at break, John Warner, and kind of realized, like, my life has been aligned with soil survey for about 32 years by virtue of my connection with Susan. And, uh, and so it's, a, it's, a, it's, you know, it's quite an honor to have a chance to be able to speak to you all at your national conference. There is also an alignment with the research lab that I work at. Uh, with respect to soil survey ac activities. Historically, we were actually for a short period of time a, a regional soil survey lab. And so I'm going to share a, a little bit of, about that. Um, uh, but it, I'm going to you know, basically cover, I guess, three things in this talk. It's going to be very short. Um, you really can't talk about the soil survey laboratory unless you know what happened prior to that. And, uh, and also what's gone on afterwards. So three, three parts, the past the short period of time when we had the soil survey laboratory at, uh, at the field station, and then what we've done since. And so, so this story really starts with the establishment of the Northern Great Plains Field Station in 1912. The citizens of Mandan worked tirelessly for a number of years to get a research station established um, in, in, in Mandan, and they were successful in 1912. And you can see from the sort of the, the charter that was, that was established for it that it was, it was intended to be pretty diverse. And you know, keep in mind, we didn't have the transportation networks that we have today, and so it was all about agriculture in place. So you know, certainly there was the agronomy, there was the grazing, but there was also a very strong horticultural component in addition to also windbreaks. That, that wind that Ruth talked about is very important. And we were part of USDA at the time. It was the Division of Dryland Agriculture is where we were, uh, where I guess we were, were pigeonholed. Um, the early soils research for about the first 30 years was focused almost entirely on understanding soil water dynamics. John Thysel, J.T. Sarvis, uh, the two scientists at the time that were leading the crop and the range work, they realized, you know, everything happens if you've got moisture. If you don't have moisture, you're going to have you're going to have problems. And so their question was, well, how you know how do our different management practices affect soil moisture pra uh, in, in in the profile? So they had two major uh, crop rotations uh, studies uh, at the lab. They also had a, a, a grazed uh, stocking rate study. Uh, two of treatments yet survive today at the lab. They're over oh, nearly 110 years old. And of course, there were the shelter belts. And there were no you know, TDR probes or, or even Giddings probes. They were taking all these samples by hand, sometimes down to six feet using that king tube. So it's a pretty, pretty significant physical toll. Um, but the, 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 the research at the lab uh, with respect to soils took a completely different trajectory in 1942 with the arrival of Howard Haas. Now Howard, um, he, had, he had worked at a research station in Garden City, Kansas, uh, starting in 1937. He was a fresh graduate from Kansas State University. And uh, Ernie George, who was the superintendent at the Mandan lab at the time, enticed him to come north. And it was great, because he was all about soils and very, very, I guess, uh, ambitious uh, in his role. Um, he, you know, he expanded the, uh, the, the, the number of assessments that were made to look at uh, soil chemical uh, properties. Um, he also did some penetration resistance measurements and so forth, but also continuing the soil moisture uh, measurements as well. And every part of the, res of the research portfolio at the lab was sort of, he, he took it on. And so it was, it's amazing to look at his reports for the first seven or eight years. Um, he did a tremendous amount of work. Um, he had a pretty modest lab. Um, this is what currently today is building 28. He uh, retrofitted 
the sort of the eastern uh, second floor of the uh, of, of what was originally the sort of the seed storage uh, um, uh, um, uh, building, um, and and set up a, a pretty I guess modest floor plan. He had about 600 square feet for a soils laboratory, uh, about about a third of that just for soil processing, and he was also sharing space with all of the seed, you know, cleaning and so forth uh, activities as well. So it was pretty cramped space, but he, but he made do. And he uh, had, a, had a, I know you can't see this, but every annual report has these lists of all the things that he brought in to establish that laboratory. Now, mind you, this is during wartime, right? So this is 1942. So he went without a, a, a still for distilled water for like, it took, I don't think he got one until 1945. So he was making do, so to speak. And if he needed to do any soil chemical analyses, those were actually shipped to Beltsville, where there was a, there was a lab there where they took care of all those analyses. Major outcomes from uh, Howard's work was, was, was extensive. He, he looked at the declines in soil fertility um, in uh, the crop rotation studies, essentially comparing different rotations to sort of native vegetation under the same soil type and looking at the, the changes over about 30 years of cropping. Uh, quantified forage responses to synthetic fertilizers, which were just starting to be used at the time. And then also he really you know, dug deep on the whole uh, issue of soil water dynamics under, uh, under the different practices that we had. And I could go into depth into some of the charts that he has, but uh, uh, that, that would take us off and on, on a tangent. But it was a pretty impressive data set. Now, think about agriculture in the 1940s. Things were really evolving post-war. Um, you know, first off, we had the Pick Sloan program, the dam, devastating for livelihoods for our native uh, populations. Um, it also brought in some additional challenges with respect to, to soil management. Mechanization was really ramping up. Irrigation was, was starting to become something that would be thought of being used more frequently throughout the state. Um, and, and of course, fertilizers, chemical fertilizers were, were coming into vogue. And so there was a need for soil sort of suitability assessments throughout the state at a higher level than it ever had been done before. And, um, and so this is what really, I think, this set the platform for the need for a soil, a regional soil survey laboratory. And this one was referred to the Missouri Basin Soil Survey Laboratory, essentially serving much of North Dakota, but parts of other parts of the Northern Great Plains. Um, this building has had quite a history. It was originally, this is a picture right now from 1913, this is originally the bunkhouse. Okay, and the bunkhouse is where all the seasonal workers lived, and it also doubles as a, as a cafeteria. And it functioned in this role up until about 1940, and then I'm not sure what happened between 1940 and 1949, but it was recommissioned, and then 49 it started as, as a laboratory. They re, you know, obviously reconfined the, uh, the, 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 the inside of it. I think they expanded it and, um, and uh, provided uh, uh, space for, for doing laboratory activities. Now, when I accepted to give this talk, I had not gone through all of the archived information that we have at the lab, which is really extensive, thinking that I would find a lot of information about the Soil Survey Laboratory. I found one book, three inches thick, and it's all has this information, has the all the things that you'd expect, right, for descriptions. You got descriptions on one side and then you have all the laboratory data on the other. And I, I know you, you probably can't see this and I don't know, yeah, this doesn't work, but it shows that the individual who did this, the, the mapping, it was by CAM and this is the Clint Moglin the, you know, that, that Dr. Hopkins shared with us. So, so there's a, a connection there, but this had all the, the information that you'd expect you get from a soil survey laboratory. You had, information on pH, organic matter, particle size distribution. You have the soil water content data at the tenth and a third bar. And then all the information on exchangeable cations and so forth. So they were turning out a lot of stuff um, in, that, in that building. And, and the proof of the pudding is right at the end. Analysis by SCS Soil Survey Lab, Mandan, North Dakota. I will say when I saw that, it was like, whew. I'm off the hook, we found it, good. So there's the connection there. <laughs> so, um, but 
the laboratory didn't just support soil survey act, uh, activities. It also supported projects that were going on in the lab. Now, I mentioned Howard Haas and the, the, the assessment that he did on our crop rotation studies in Mandan uh, documenting declines in soil fertility. Well, he actually expanded that study across the Great Plains. Um, 16 other sites from Big Springs, Texas, all the way to Havre, Montana, where they had long-term cropping studies, and he was able to quantify, sort of the, th with that, the, sort of the changes and declines of soil carbon and nitrogen across all of the U.S. Great Plains. And so it was actually the first characterization that we had of this region across a very large geographical area. Really powerful stuff, published in 1957, technical bulletin 1164, and perhaps most impressively is that he had the foresight to keep all 3,900 samples, and so that's part of our soil archive today, and it's still generating some really exciting stories. All right, so everything comes to an end. I mean, first there was a change. Uh, the Soil Survey Laboratory was transferred to the SCS in 1951, and then in 1956 it moved down to Lincoln, Nebraska, which I believe was part of a larger consolidation effort. I think there was labs in Riverside and Beltsville, and they all moved to, to the lab in Lincoln. All right, but it really set off at just an amazing sort of firestorm of activity related to soil science at the research lab. By my count, there were 22 soil scientists hired between 1949 and 1969. I'm seeing Dave's facial expression. Yes, exactly, that's exactly how I felt. And it was just incredible that, that all the things that they were looking at, and they hired some big names, Jim Power, Fred Sandoval, Wayne Willis. Um, they tackled a lot of big problems and challenges and provided sort of soil, you know, sort of soil-based uh, guidance on, on how, to, how to effectively manage uh, some, some, some challenging conditions. Um, and so it's, uh, and, and, and it also set I guess set the sort of the, the, the platform for building a new laboratory because we the, the, the laboratory in what currently is building three was available but they needed more capacity and so they built a, a new soil laboratory and that's what they referred to it as in the annual report I was quite pleased with that and that happens to be our main laboratory yet today so. All right, so a little bit of let's put a little bit of the past um, our, our affiliation with SCS and now NRCS has been very strong over the years. Uh, by my count, there has been at least three detailed soil surveys that have been done on, on, uh, uh, on, the, on the land that the laboratory uses for research, and this is hugely helpful with respect to making decisions on locations of uh, reps for plots and so forth. Um, we've been, a, I think, a, a pretty good uh, partner with respect to uh, training activities, the, the soil health, the conservation planning. Um, our sites are, are well suited to be able to, to facilitate those types of, uh, of trainings. Um, your you know, activities that you've done in the DSPs, um, we've been able to carve out some space for assessments for KSAT and so forth, and that's been a plus for us as well because it allows us to better understand our management practices because some of our long-term treatments have been part of your DSPs, and so we're thankful for that. And then I think more, most recently, um, Wade and his crew and Jeannie, I think you all sampled our LTAR sites. This is the long-term agroecosystem research sites. We have a cropland common experiment and also a grazing land common experiment. They went through and, and did profile descriptions on all of our plots and our fields, which is just incredible, because of course we're using fixed depths for our sampling for, you know, on the ARS side, and so we have that to be able to compare to. Very important when you're thinking about a 30-year project. So, um, so yeah, I wanna just, you know, I couldn't have been able to pull this together without some of our, our, our two historians, Rich Cunningham and Al, Al, uh, Al Frank. Um, uh, Rich did a great job in digitizing all of the photos that I was able to share with you today. And Al is sort of our resident historian. He uh, wrote a uh, uh, sort of a book, The Taming of the Prairie. It's, it's available online. It covers the first 100 years of the lab. Um, and if the PDF is free for download, I encourage you to, to look in that if it's, uh, if it's something you're interested in. It's been a lot, of, a lot of good work has been done. So thanks so much for your, uh, for your attention. Yeah, right on time.
All right. Thanks, Mark.